good evening, everybody. I'm uh, going to go ahead and call to order the Bristol, Virginia City Council meeting for today, January the 10th, 2023. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's good to see a uh, fairly full house tonight uh, on this cold night. Uh, got several important things on the agenda, uh, hearing from some outside organizations and uh, some financial folks and doing some other city business. I'm uh, going to go ahead and jump right in for council comments. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just wanted to have two quick comments. Um, yesterday, there was a, uh, a structure that was on fire on the Tennessee side, uh, close to downtown Bristol. I believe it was some sort of a, a house, and um, you know, I believe that there was you know, Bristol, Virginia, also went to to help as well. And I just wanted to say I appreciate all of the work that our first responders do. I don't think people think about the complexity sometimes being in two states. And the, uh, the, the coordination, the communication between our, our first responders is great. So I appreciate all of those folks over there. Um, I did want to also add that uh, the last time we met, we uh, assigned our different boards and committees that we'll all be on. There was one that was inadvertently left off, the, the MPO, uh, that I did want to state for the record that I believe Mr. Mr. Neil Osborne will be serving on that going forward, just so we had that in there. Uh, one thing that I will add, um, I know we're a little bit late on it, uh, over the, uh, right around the week of Christmas, uh, when it was incredibly cold, you know, the city of Bristol opened uh, an emergency shelter at Highlands Fellowship Church, um, and I received word from one of our city employees, uh, and just wanted to kind of recognize um, what our employees from the Department of Social Services did uh, during that time. They had uh, 23 employees that staffed the shelter uh, in, in very long shifts, you know, some of them 10 straight hours, you know, working there, some five hours, uh, you know, over the Christmas holiday. Uh, and I just want to uh, recognize those employees, those 23 employees from Department of Social Services who did such a good job uh, staffing our shelter to, uh, to help people in a very difficult time. So uh, I thank them for what they did for our city and, uh, and I want to recognize them for that. Uh, city manager's comments. I'll give you one bit of uh, good financial news. Um, I was notified last week by Casey Barnes out at the golf course that our, um, for the first time ever, the uh, city golf course has taken in over a million dollars in revenue from January 1 to December 31. So that's the first time that's happened uh, for our city golf course. So I want to say congratulations to Casey and his staff for making a Clear Creek a good golf course that everybody likes to play at. It's fantastic. Good news. All right, uh, item C is matters to be presented by members of the public, uh, non-agenda items. Just, uh, just a quick rundown on how this works if, if you've never done it before. So when I call your name, uh, come up to the microphone and uh, tell us where you're from, tell, your, tell us your name. Uh, you have three minutes. Uh, the green light comes on when the three minutes starts. Uh, when you're almost out of time, the light goes yellow, and then when your time is up, the light goes red. And just kind of wrap up your thought uh, so we can uh, make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Uh, first person on the agenda for sign up is uh, Angie Bush. Hello, yes, I'm Angie Bush. I live at 19310 Stone Mountain Road, Abingdon, Virginia. I do work here in Bristol and I worship here in Bristol, just less than three miles away on Euclid Avenue. Um, during the week, I would say that majority of my time is uh, of my waking hours are here in Bristol, Virginia. I, like I said, I work, I worship, I eat here, I shop here. Um, I am just one of the people from the Southwest Virginia region who, um, Southwest, Southwest Virginia, Northern Tennessee region, who cares about Bristol. 
So in October, the City Council voted unanimously to send the pro-life zoning ordinance to the Planning Committee. Nevertheless, the Planning Committee has failed to put this on their agenda, and it seems so that the ball is back in your court. Um, so you will hear today from people who will give you some specifics about the horrific nature of abortion, it, um, how, it's, how it's murder, how it hurts people, how it hurts our community, um, how um, it is the, the taking of innocent life. One thing I want to bring up is that there were, are going to be people who will approach you who will say, but this is legal and this is my right. And so I want to remind you that slavery and segregation were legal. They were absolutely legal. And half of our country embraced this le legal right because they had dehumanized another half of our country, specifically our African Americans. Now half of our country dehumanizes the preborn child, the preborn human, the, the infant in the womb, because they are not accepting the scientific fact that this child, this person in the womb, is 100% a person, unique DNA, heartbeat, by day 18, day 21, um, and that this person just sci scientifically, yes, but also we are made in the image and likeness of God. And you will hear all of those arguments. So do not listen to this lie that it is legal. It is my right because we've, our country has listened to that lie before. And we now look back on history and we realize how wrong we were to dehumanize half of our population. I urge you to move forward and make Bristol a safe zone. And as you move forward, I urge you to remember that by moving forward, making Bristol a safe zone, you will be on the correct, the right, the just side of history when people look back at what you've done here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Early. Hello, my name is Dr. Jacqueline Early. I live at 15421 Briarwood Lane in Abingdon, and I attend church here in Bristol at St. Anne. I'm here to address your inaction on the abortion business in this city, which offers no benefit to the residents and is used for abortion tourism in this great community. Because I'm an emergency physician, when patients see me, it is not a planned part of their day. They must trust that I'm going to make the right decision for them because I am in a position to do that, and their life depends on it. And my decisions affect not only the patient, but their family, me, the staff, and all of you. One decision can affect an awful lot of people. What position are you in? What responsibilities do you have to your citizens? Maybe you don't realize how abortions affect you and everybody in our community. So here are some true stories. Suppose you're in the ER waiting room wondering what's taking so long. You wait to be seen because I'm in the room with a woman that took abortion pills and is crying and screaming, help me Jesus, and put it back. As she aborts her child and she realizes the gravity of her decision. What else aren't you aware of? I have had an ultrasound tech who recently miscarried her baby come to me crying that she doesn't want to be in the same room with the woman who had an abortion and threw her baby in the trash. So I have to spend my time talking to all of the ultrasound techs until I get somebody to go in her room that won't break down in tears. Meanwhile, you're getting more upset wondering why you're waiting hours in the waiting room. Well, there's now a woman who chose to have an abortion having bleeding complications. I have one nurse running to the blood bank. I'm calling the OBGYN doctor. Another nurse is calling the OR staff who have to leave their families at home and come in. I have two nurses in the room trying to start IV access. So why do you think that this person's decision doesn't affect everybody here in Bristol? I have four nurses and myself tied up with one patient that is bleeding from her decision, but the abortion industry has the nerve to tell you that that patient's abortion decision doesn't affect you. Do you understand how much weight a single decision can have? Her decision, your decision. So now that patient is in the OR and we have an empty ER room, but sorry, you can't be placed in it yet because housekeeping has to clean the blood off the bed and the floor. 
That's how it affects you. So don't let people tell you that it's none of your business and it doesn't affect you. Right now, you're tasked to make decisions that will affect all of the lives in Bristol, born and unborn. Why are you on this council and how are you trying to help, help us and why are you so afraid? What excuse are you using to justify not supporting the weakest and most vulnerable? Boy, I would be a terrible doctor if I was afraid to be involved in stressful situations, have uncomfortable conversations, upset some people, and make hard decisions. Your decisions affect a lot of people and you have the right and the duty to protect us. Accept that some people will hate you, curse you, talk about you, sue you, do everything they can to destroy the truth that life is valuable. Do not be afraid. The people in Bristol are placing their trust in you to do the right thing for them. Your decision will not outlaw abortions in Virginia, but it will keep Bristol a good place to live, which is your job. From someone who understands the weight of life and death decisions, you must do what's best for us, for our families, and for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Aisha Yuhas. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Oh, I get it all the time. <laughs> So it's Isha Uhas, 5038 Little Wolf Run Road, Bristol, Virginia, and I'm a Virginia attorney. So as she said, on October 25th, uh, the city council voted unanimously to send a pro-life zoning ordinance to the planning commission. At the subsequent planning commission meeting, the zoning ordinance uh, appeared only on the closed portion of the agenda. So there was no open meeting on that. And from all evidence, it appears that the city attorney scared the living daylights out of the planning commission. Um, and they sort of dropped it like a hot potato. So now it's up to you to act. Provision in the Bristol City Code, Section 50-411, states that if the Planning Commission doesn't act within 60 days, and that 60 days has passed, you guys can take it up all by yourselves. So you can do this on your own initiative. Now, the city attorney may have you scared as well and wanting to drop this like a hot potato, but this isn't actually all that scary, okay? Uh, and you're no longer alone in this either, okay? On December 13th, the Washington County Board of Supervisors passed a first reading of a zoning ordinance regulating the location of abortion clinics in Washington County. You guys are local government. You guys do land use regulations all the time, okay? And that's what we're requesting. We're requesting that you regulate the location of abortion clinics, all right? The Washington County Ordinance was drafted by the Washington County uh, attorney. Her name is Lucy Phillips. Okay, she's actually about to retire, but she's very well regarded. She's considered one of the top county attorneys in the Commonwealth. Okay, the Washington County Board of Supervisors directed her to draft an ordinance that she thought would pass legal muster, and that's what she came up with and what was presented to the board. So I suggest you do something similar. Tell your city attorney, direct him, okay, you come up with something that you think is going to work for Bristol. Don't just drop this, all right? The, they're not going away. They stand on street corners in the middle of winter trying to counsel women. They're not going to go away, all right? So let's come up with a solution that makes everyone comfortable with the litigation risks as well as meeting the needs of your constituents. You want an attractive, harmonious community, all right? We can get this done. All right, to paraphrase a recent campaign slogan, all right, do the right things, do them right. Thank you. Mr. Uhas, with all due respect, you have no idea what I told my city council as a legal recommendation and to sit here and say that I scared the planning commission and city council, that is completely inaccurate and it's wrong. And as a member of the bar, you should be ashamed of yourself to come in here and tell a member of the uh, city council that I did that to my client. I don't then you, that's exactly what you said, and you don't know what I said, so don't ever sit here and say that again. Next person is uh, Erica Schausenbach. And I apologize to you if I didn't say that right. Pretty close, actually. Um, thank you, council members. My name is Erica Schausenbach. I live at 5505 Mendota Road in Mendota, Virginia. I speak to you today about what abortion bring businesses bring to the city. For nearly 10 years now, I've been reaching out to women getting abortions at the facility in Bristol, Tennessee, and now here in Bristol, Virginia. I've spent hundreds of hours on the sidewalks and public areas around the Pr Bristol killing facilities, and I testify firsthand to what goes on there. Besides the fact that the murder of innocent preborn children goes on there, which should be your primary concern, abortion facilities also bring many other ills to the community. 
Bristol, Virginia is already seeing negative effects. We have become a destination for baby murder. Just in the past few weeks, we've seen patrons from West Virginia, Kentucky, Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and others at the Bristol facility. They come, they kill, they leave. Do you think Bristol is better for it? I can testify that allowing baby killing within your jurisdiction, while obviously being bad for the babies, is also, it also consumes time and resources from the city. Some examples from my experience in Bristol, Tennessee, are that police resources, the chaos of the killing facility in Bristol, Tennessee, precipitated so many calls to law enforcement that the police department made it policy that they would no longer answer our calls at that location. City officials, the police chief, district attorney, and city attorney spent much time in meetings and on calls with attorneys regarding the rights of Christians to, to peacefully advocate in public areas. The city received legal letters on at least five occasions regarding the infringement of First Amendment rights of Christians advocating for babies and the ongoing illegal behavior by clinic escorts. And these letters had to be responded to by the city attorney and appropriate correction given to law enforcement officers. It brought conflict to the surrounding neighborhood. Among other things, loud noise was often blasted into the neighborhood. Clinic escorts, some now who now come to the facility in your city, demonstrated extremely lewd behavior, including but not limited to touching themselves in sexually suggestive manner in front of small children. Uh, ex blasting extremely sexually explicit music on speakers in the public street and stalking and harassing those advocating for life. Clinic escorts were so physically aggressive and threatening toward me that in 2020 I filed petitions for protective orders in T Sullivan County, Tennessee. While the court openly recognized the reprehensible behavior of the clinic escorts, they denied my petitions. The Tennessee Appellate Court has since found reversible error in that decision. These things don't go away, they just keep returning to your doorstep once you have let them in the door. Council members, the Bible says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death, hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we didn't know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay to man according to his work? I urge you to put the Safe Zone for Life ordinance back on your agenda and to do what it takes to pass it swiftly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Mary Peters. Okay. Mary Peters, 19170 Paddock Place, Abingdon. No, I don't live in Bristol, but I'm in Bristol a lot for shopping, and previously my church met here, so this is why it's so important to me. I am disappointed to see that mo the most important issue of adopting a pro-life ordinance for the city of Bristol was not prioritized, prioritized enough to be on tonight's agenda. I don't know what the holdup is, but it should be clear by now that the legal authority you possess in this matter, as well as the moral responsibility before God and your constituents, makes it critical that quick progress be made by this council. If the planning committee is delaying their duties, then you should move to take it back from them and proactively further this process to its completion. The combined lack of messaging and action by everyone involved sends a clear and welcoming message to those who would relish the opportunity to expand the horrendous life-ending business of abortion in this city and surrounding areas. Yes, we all know that abortion is legal in our state. Just because it's legal does not make it morally right. Just because it's legal in Virginia does not make it beneficial for our small area, the city that you vowed to do what's best for. Think back just a little in history to when chattel slavery, also known as man-stealing, was considered a right. I've been told personally, if you don't like abortion, then don't have one. How about if I don't like human trafficking? Should I just not traffic humans and then all is well? I think not. 
human trafficking and abortion go hand in hand, as you should know. And they are both occurring in our neighborhood. Apparently, we have not come as far from our nation's tainted history as we thought. We must not turn a blind eye to the evil happening around us, legal or not. We are making history as we speak. It is, not, it is not your duty to sit on your hands or to kick the can down the road a little bit. We hope and pray that you would send an unambiguous message to everyone with eyes on our small community, that Bristol values life at every age and stage. If there are those who are hell-bent on ending human innocent life, and believe me, there are, for the love of everything good, let them do it elsewhere, not in our city, not on our watch. We as a city already have enough blood on our hands with the existing abortion clinic. I just recently started going there myself to pray for these families. And when I stand there praying, it breaks my heart to see three people driving in, knowing only two of them will leave alive. It should break your heart, too. This is truly a matter of life and death. God help us. Thank you. All right, next speaker is Charles Humphrey. Good evening. I'm Charles Humphrey. I live in Mendota, Virginia. Um, from this area, <clears throat> been around this area all of my life. Um, I am a pastor at Communion Fellowship Church. We did recently meet for the last five years here in Bristol, and um, currently we are home churching and planning on um, residing in Mendota fairly soon. Um, as a pastor, um, pastors like three points. So I've got three points for you. Um, one is that. Uh, we're in a new time with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, the Supreme Court realized they made a mistake, that they tried to create a right that they could not create, one that did not exist. It took a long time, uh, my whole lifetime actually, it took for the court to realize that they made a mistake. But because of that now, um, the decisions that have to be made regarding this matter are going to be handled much more locally. And it is within your normal work to do this kind of thing. And I heard is that in this meeting, like I hear in a lot of these kind of meetings, we recognize emergency response um, in this situation. We also uh, recognize uh, people who were vulnerable in homelessness uh, during the cold weather. And if you think about those particular situations, you see that it is consistent that this ordinance uh, to get abortion mills out of this area is the same kind of thing. When you have a house that's on fire, you have people who are in a place that they normally feel safe um, and protected, and they are in danger. Uh, just like a child in the womb of its mother is in danger when they are about to be aborted. Now, it's not scary for a city council to do things that are right, like helping the emergency response be involved in that, um, but it is scary for the person who is in a place that should be a place of safety when they are exposed in, in harm's way. Secondly, um, a homeless family or a homeless individual. It's not scary for the city council to do things to help and support and to encourage helping those kind of people that are weak. The same thing, it shouldn't be scary for you all to pass an ordinance that would protect those who are weak. History will not forget just like we will not forget the mistake the Supreme Court made. Secondly, the people in this region, the people in this city, have been very clear, and they are not going away. Just like Erica said, we will continue to be here, and you are representatives of those people, so you should not forget that, and you should act on that, so the people will not forget. And then lastly, these children are, are made in God's image, and it is the moral thing to protect life, especially the weakest among, among us. God will not forget. And so there are plenty of reasons for you not to forget to do your job. Do not forget this ordinance. It is a simple ordinance. Other places are doing this. It is now the responsibilities of these types of jurisdictions to not forget to protect those who are vulnerable, who are weak, who are exposed, who are in danger, just like we heard an ambulance or a fire truck go by. It's time to act quickly, and it's time to act now. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, that is the last person signed up for public comment. Uh, next item is the adoption of the agenda. Looking for a motion and a second. Uh, um, I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Motion by the vice mayor to adopt the agenda and second by Mr. Farnham. Pl uh, please call the roll. Farnham? Yes. <clears throat> Holmes? Yes. Nave? Yes. Pollard? Yes. Osborne? Yes. All right. Uh, item one for the regular agenda, presentation from the birthplace of country music. Uh, Council, tonight we have Leah Ross, Executive Director of Advancement for the Birthplace of Country Music. She's going to give you an update on the birthplace of the country music. All right. There you go. I'm challenging. <laughs> City Council, I appreciate the opportunity to come here tonight and make a presentation to you. I'm here to talk about our year that we just finished and give you an update on where we are. Our mission, as you can see, is uh, I want to highlight some things, and one of them is one of our mission is to educate and engage audiences worldwide regarding the history, impact, and legacy of the 19 Bristol, 27 Bristol Sessions, and to create an education and recognition for us. And one of the things you're going to see through this uh, presentation that we are doing all of those things. So I'm going to talk about our three branches of the organization. We have the Radio Bristol, which a lot of you all know about. This, uh, if you look at this right here, we have listeners in all 50 states and 140 foreign countries. We have an 18 million person footprint for our Farm and Fun Time uh, show that's on PBS station. This is our third, ses uh, third season for Farm and Fun Time. It's really more than that, but with COVID, we could not record and have those things. But one of the things that we're proud of is being on Blue Ridge PBS, East Tennessee PBS, and all of North Carolina PBS. Our goal is to be nationally in the next couple of years, and we're working on that diligently to get that done. Then let's talk about Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion. We definitely had a great year this past year. We had, if we look at our media, because we did a lot of stuff on that this year, we had 170 million combined audience media outlets covering our festival, which is pretty phenomenal. We had around 32,000 festival attendees, and if you look at that based over 2021, uh, it was an increase of 28%. So we do see that that, that, that attendance is coming back. We had 13.5 million festival media impressions out there. We had 650 visitors from different cities. We had 44 states reckon, reckon, uh, here this year, and we had visitors from 10 countries. Some of our notable outlets that were here, as you can see, was Rolling Stone. T we had coverage in the Tennessee, in the Travel and Leisure uh, um, magazine. One of the things that we were really proud of, we had a a gentleman from NPR who has a uh, podcast, uh, national uh, podcast that came here and he interviewed not only some of our artists here, but he interviewed some of our city leaders. He, did, he uh, went to different businesses and they're still airing today and we've get, gotten a lot of uh, comments on it. We also had Wide Open Country here and then the 16.1 million economic impact, as you can see, that, that was from 2005. So we are hoping to do one in 2023. And I started to think what year we're in. Um, so we th think that we'll even see more than that. So we're very proud of that. I'm clicking, Jean. It went one too fast, went too fast. Go back. I need to go to the slide on birthplace of country music. No, we try. It's working. That's it, okay. So let me talk a little bit about the birthplace of country music museum, which we're very proud of. We had, in, if we look at our group tours, which is something that we want to do every year, is increase those. 
Um, coming off of the pandemic, we thought we had a great year because we had an increase of 35 tours this past year. Uh, we had uh, not quite 20,000 visitors to the museum, but that was an increase of, of 1,000 over 2021. And then we also dealt, had a great time with our students coming to the museum and working with them virtually that we impacted 23,600 students. We had visitors from 2,250 cities this past year, 50 states and four countries. Um, we believe that this number is gonna be higher for 2023. <coughs> Some of the things that we do, especially with students, we work with the, w, uh, the YWCA Tech Girls. We also have a, a um, after school program with Virginia Middle School where they got a grant to partnership with us. So that's really exciting for us because we're telling them about the history and teaching them the sounds and different things uh, that we do there. But we really think we'll see an increase in this. We are scheduled to go to the uh, American Bus Association Conference in February. We have over 50 um, um, appointments already set up for that over a, a two day time period. It's sort of like um, uh, speed dating. And a total to this year already that we booked since January, we have 20 tours coming already this year. Another thing that happened last year was the Born in Bristol film. I don't know if uh, all of you are aware of that, but it's been several years since we did a film here in Bristol talking about the Bristol Sessions. And we worked diligently with Virginia Tourism to do that film and Tennessee Tourism. And one of the things that happened, I, I met with Tennessee Tourism and said, we've got to get this out there this year. And so we worked really hard to get it out there. And Diddy TV out of Nashville carried that uh, film and so did Circle TV out of Memphis. And the, thing, the good thing about Circle TV is they're out of Memphis and they uh, have uh, coverage across uh, uh, greater. They're in Australia and a lot of the foreign countries. So we had a great summer. We also showed it at the mural and had a kickoff for that. We are seeing traffic in our museum from that film, just like we did when Ken Burns uh, did his uh, um, uh, film on country music. So. Now, lastly, I'd like to give you a little update on our annex, which is the building between the museum and the Bristol Hotel. You know, we've had that for several years, and uh, we think we're ready to pull the trigger and get it started. The total cost that we estimate to complete the re renovation is a little over $3 million. We have received the following grants. We received, we received 500000 from the Federal House Appropriations on a community project building funding. We also just recently received 50,000 from the Tobacco Commission, and we got a 50,000 grant from the GNAM Foundation. So once we did that, it's gonna make us uh, be able to uh, instigate our historic and new market tax credits. We have a meeting this week to start that process. Normally it takes anywhere from four to six months to get all of that done, but we do have people that are interested in them. And once we get that, um, and we think that we'll have construction, it'll take about 18 to 24 months, and we'll be able to open that. One of the things that that's gonna do for us, we will have a more educational space. We will be moving our museum offices into that building, and our radio uh, staff will move into that building. So we're really excited about that. But the big thing is, it's gonna give us more room for exhibit space upstairs, it allows us to add restrooms upstairs because we hear about that all the time. Do you have restroom here? But the one of the, not biggest thing, but one thing that we're excited about, where our special exhibit is right now in the front of the building, it will move over into the new part of the building where it doesn't have windows that really um, has a real challenge when we're bringing special exhibits in and it will give us that space to do rentals and have that for special events because we get um, uh, inquiries all the time about renting our facility and we do so, do some but it will really help that so that was my presentation today just to give you a quick update on where we are we think 2023 if we're looking at our festival our ticket sales are quite a I won't, don't want to say a, 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 long, a whole way above us, but we're trending on a very positive. We will be announcing uh, our headliners on 
January the 26th, and we think that that will, but we're already ahead as of this date from where we were last year by about 25%. So we think we'll have another good year there and a good year in our museum for you all to bring economic development and economic impact to your uh, city. Thank you for letting me present. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, item two is a presentation from Bristol Regional Medical Center. Yeah, council tonight you have uh, John Jeter with the Bristol Regional Medical Center here to give a presentation on uh, what's happening out at the hospital. Thank you all so much for this opportunity to come and uh, present about what's going on in Ballard Health and Bristol Regional Medical Center. Uh, Ballard probably needs no introduction. We're approaching our fifth anniversary on February the 1st of this year. Our mission continues to be to honor those we serve by delivering the best possible care. And to do that, we're, we're working to become a national model for improving rural health. We're trying to consistently deliver value through high quality, low cost care and also improve population health through community investments. For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these slides and, and try to get down to the meat of the presentation. You know, nationwide, more than 136 rural hospitals have closed in the last decade plus, but here in our region, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, every community that uh, had a hospital prior to our merger continues to have a, mer uh, a hospital. And in fact, we're expanding and trying to reimagine how we deliver care uh, here in, in this area. One of the ways we're doing that, uh, just over 18 months ago, Ballot invested $20 million to reopen Lee County Community Hospital in Southwest Virginia back in July of 2021. <coughs> It's a small, it's 10 bed, modern medical facility designed to meet the needs of, those, of that community. Uh, since reopening, it's definitely met the expectations and more. I, I can tell you as I round at Bristol Regional, I also serve as the CEO at Johnson Memorial in Abingdon, and I run into patients and family members uh, who all the time have spent uh, time at Lee County uh, Community Hospital and are so thankful for the opportunity to have that health care up in Lee County. We've also have launched a partnership with East Tennessee State University to launch the Appalachian Highlands Center for Nursing Advancement. Ballot and ETSU announced this creation. The goal is to attract and retain more nurses in rural communities across the Appalachian Highlands. We know that nursing uh, resources are the lifeblood of healthcare and it's critical that we have strong nurses. Uh, it's designed to combat nursing shortages uh, with state-of-the-art training and education and the implementation of this center is designed to create a local pipeline from high school through advanced education to provide nursing in our region. We're also one of the things that the the pandemic has brought on that's uh, made really really important is the use of telehealth programs. It's certainly expedited the acceptance we believe of telehealth and we're working very hard to continue to develop telehealth throughout our region trying to provide uh, more specialties and providers out to the to, to the regional uh, outreach areas in our rural communities. We think it's a game changer for rural health uh, to provide access to those who may not be close to a, a physical clinic uh, out throughout our region. Another thing that we're doing is we're expanding Ballot Health's nice longer children's network. We opened a strong futures facility in Greenville to full capacity. We've expanded the Children's Resource Center both at Nicewater Children's Hospital and up in Johnson Memorial Hospital in Abingdon. We've expanded school-based virtual urgent cares and behavioral health to provide access to children in schools. Uh, we've kicked off a construction project to expand the Nicewater Children's Hospital to include the J.D. Nicewander Family Perinatal Pediatric Institute uh, with state-of-the-art neonatal intensive care unit. We also, uh, back in October of 2020, opened the Pediatric Emergency Department at Bristol Regional. We just, a few months ago, opened one at Indian Path. Since we've opened the one here at Bristol, our volumes for pedi pediatrics have doubled. And so we're definitely seeing more and more children in that specialized center here at Bristol. And we're very pleased to be able to offer that service. Uh, one of the most important things we have is, is really we're a service organization. We can't do anything without people and certainly as we've seen labor shortages across almost every industry, healthcare is no exception. And since May of 2019, Ballot has been working to invest in its workforce. We've increased hiring rates for nurses, uh, plus increases for bed not, bedside nursing and support staff. We've launched bonuses, recruitment incentives. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the development of some new child care centers and family affinity programs to invest in augmenting the pipeline for new regional health care workers here in our region. We've doubled the annual wage increase and the on-call rates of pay for our team as well. These adjustments have resulted in over 120 million incremental investment in wages. That, that represents about half the annual cash flow of Ballot Health. Uh, a lot of these investments have historically gone to capital improvement. We're making a capital improvement, but it's more in the workforce uh, uh, for our region to make sure that we've got the staff necessary to care for our community. Our average hourly rate increased uh, over 19 percent, average increase of 40 percent in the base hiring weight rates. Uh, our pay increase, we've, been, we've done 2 percent since Ballad was formed, we're doing 4 percent. Our hiring rates for nursing has gone from between 22 and 27 dollars an hour. So pretty significant increases in what we are paying to take care of our community. I mentioned the affordable child care. This is something we're really, really excited about. The Board of Trustees for Ballot Health has approved the expansion of two existing child uh, care centers and the construction of 11 new centers. That includes a large, um, a planned large child care center here on State Street in Bristol. Uh, there's also going to be a large child care center up in Abingdon, uh, in, in uh, the city or the town of Abingdon. And so there's a lot of exciting things that we think that we're going to be able to do as a result of that. This is coming together through partnerships with, with uh, community organizations as well as other business to try to make sure that we have affordable child care in our area. Uh, the Balladeer Affinity Program, it, it's a interesting, I, I think when we set this up, it's designed for ballot health children and families to come and become closer together uh, and, and to um, create more community among our team members and their families. We hope to have 500. We're now up to 1,700. Uh, almost 950 families are enrolled in just the first few weeks since we've announced this, and we think there's a lot more uh, that will be joining. And it's a really interesting thing. Uh, just a few months ago, I think Tim Tebow was down at Nicewanger visiting with all the, the balladeers, and it was a really great event down there. And we're doing a number of things to really help bond these uh, families together in a, in a closer community. I think these things are paying off. I do want to be transparent about this. Bristol Regional Medical Center, our team member turnover for the first five months of the year, fiscal year, is well below where we were running in the last two fiscal years. And if you were to look at our nursing, we are at just, we're annualizing to 10% turnover amongst our nursing, which, you know, if you look at last year, uh, we were at 27.5% at the same time. So that's almost a third of where we were running uh, just a year ago. And so we're very, very proud of uh, the improvement that we're seeing, certainly on our turnover rates. And we think we know that recruitment is difficult, so retention becomes absolutely critical for us to be successful. And I think we're doing a great job with that right now. I do want to talk a little bit about improving population health. Certainly, we're trying to reinforce the longstanding commitment to community health improvement here in our region. Uh, Ballot Health supported 21 regional community-based organizations this past year with over $2 million investment. Uh, we're working alongside these organizations to support specific goals and strategies aimed at improving health outcomes. Uh, we've launched uh, a, no, a new primary care mobile health coach back in August, and so we're going out into areas that don't have health care and trying to provide mobile outreach, and, and that's been really a cool thing that we've done recently. I already mentioned the Strong Futures program for women and babies, but uh, this is a, a huge uh, initiative for Ballot Health. It's um, the, the Strong Futures program that we launched was in the former Tacoma Regional Hospital in Greenville, Tennessee, for pregnant women and mothers who suffer from addiction and the need for other behavioral health services. And I know there's investigation to see if there's additional uh, programs like that that could be set up in our region. Certainly providing quality care, it's, it's part of delivering the best possible care that we can. Physician recruitment is critical to that. In FY22, we recruited uh, 11 physicians here to the Bristol market. So far in this fiscal year, we've actually, it says three, it's actually been four. Uh, we've got a new uh, oncology hematology physician, new non-invasive non -invasive cardiologist, primary care, pulmonary critical care all coming here in the next few months. We've got a lot of recruitment that we're doing. Some of the more challenging areas that we're focused on is urology, neurosurgery, behavioral health, neurology, and, and various surgical specialties. 
We're very excited. We just, at the end of December, got a new Da Vinci XI. Uh, that's Dr. Sharfstein. You may know him. He's a great surgeon we have there at Bristol. Uh, we uh, have already begun to do cases on that. We just in the last few weeks have done run three robots at the same time at Bristol. Certainly the newest technology we can have, the most advanced technology means quicker recovery time, smaller incisions, better quality outcomes. We're very, very proud of that. In addition to that, uh, we've also recently put in new lab analyzers that we believe are more sensitive and the data suggests that we'll be able to uh, identify certain diseases even sooner than we had before. The last thing I want to mention is certainly at Bristol we've been acknowledged recently with some really good um, high quality and high performing uh, areas, uh, colon cancer surgery, COPD, kidney failure, heart failure, stroke, heart attack, all of these have been recognized by US News World Reports as being high performing and we're very proud of that. Also Becker's Hospital Review recently uh, reported that Care Checks named Bristol Regional the number one hospital in the state of Tennessee for, for neurology care. So we're very, very proud of the recognition that we've received as well. And so we're certainly dedicated to taking care of our community and, and hopefully this has uh, been a good update for you guys. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those at this time. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Absolutely, first, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation and, and you know I want to applaud you all for you know, your investments in the child care centers. I know that that is, that's a struggle for working parents regardless of the field you're in. So, absolutely, you know, especially in an important field like that, it's good to be able to provide that. Yes. So I know in, in one of your slides, um, you talked about the, uh, the turnover rates uh, for nurses. It was down significantly. Yes. Um, is that number, does that account for supplanting the shortages with, with increases in travel nurses? Yeah, so, so we certainly have travel nursing at Bristol. We have it throughout our region, uh, throughout Ballard. Um, what I would say is the reduction in turnover rates has mitigated the need for additional travel nurses. And I think that's really, really important, certainly. Um, what I can tell you about travel nursing in general is the, the ability to reduce travel nurses at Bristol or anywhere else within Ballard Health or really in the healthcare industry is going to be new nurses coming out of school and our ability to hire those. Unfortunately, we have seen reductions, I think, in, in uh, nursing schools and nursing enrollment uh, coming out of the pandemic. But hopefully, as we are working with different schools in the region, whether it's King or it's Virginia Highlands Community College, where we get a lot of our nurses at Bristol and at JMH, uh, we can retain a lot of those. And that will further reduce the need for us to have travel nurses. So. Sure. And I know travel nurses can be quite expensive to very expensive to employ. Yes, yeah. Um, so one one significant portion of your presentation, it seemed like, was 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 talking about, you know, the benefits that you know you're increasing, you know, pay or you know, but but there's still a shortage. Yes. And I know that that's you know that's indicative of the entire industry and not just you all. So this is probably a bigger question for bigger question than you or I could answer. But but what's the answer in your mind to Combating the shortage, even if you're increasing the pay, it seems like you know you're. How do you, how how do we fix it going forward? Because because I, I know that, you know, as as baby boomers age, we're entering that critical time over the next several years where we're going to need more nurses in the entire industry than we ever have before. Yeah, I mean, you're speaking to the demographic shift that I think is really systemic and driving a lot of this stuff that we're seeing, probably not just in healthcare but every industry, quite honestly. Um, I, I think the things like childcare that that's. That's where we have to acknowledge is in our region, listen, it's going to be very difficult for us to compete with Knoxville and Charlotte and, and all these other areas that are also raising rates to be competitive. We've got to find things that are going to speak to this generation and that are going to be beneficial that may not be offered at every other uh, system. And so I think things like child care and ballads continue to look at other areas beyond just the wages because there's only so far we can raise wages every year. And um, we're looking at other things and I think child care is a good example of that where if we can subsidize through um, by reducing the cost of child care, not just making it available in a way that's most convenient to our employees and our team members, but making it affordable. I think that's really, really critical. And that's what Ballad's focused on right now. We think that that's the kind of stuff that can certainly make us a little more attractive and a little more unique compared to other hospital systems. And I have one other question. So um, you, you talked about 
the areas that you have hired new doctors into the market in. And, yes. and I'm assuming that's not just at Bristol, that's at This is Bristol. Overall. What I presented is Bristol. It's Bristol. Yes. Yeah. So in those areas where, where you still are struggling with, with filling positions, and, 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 you know, I hear from, you know, when, this, when the agenda published, I had several people reach out who, you know, had experienced, you know, issues. Do you, do you see that, um, that we lose people, like, who get diverted to, like, Carillion or Vanderbilt for, you know, like, knee replacements, hip replacements, those kind of things, or, or those areas that, that you touched on that, the, that we're not those, able to serve here? I, right now, I, in all those areas, I'm not seeing patients diverted to those areas specifically due to gaps. We work very hard to keep patients within our region and work with our facilities um, throughout the region. I, I can tell you the times that I've seen diversion to other areas um, primarily, not, not for the diagnosis you just mentioned, for sure, like the orthopedic stuff like that. I, I don't see that at all. We have pretty robust orthopedic care throughout our region. Uh, but, but some of the more obscure things and making sure that we have sufficient call coverage around every service line uh, can be a challenge without question. Um, but for the most part, we work to, and I, I wish I had a, a statistic that I could share around leakage from the system, but Ballard works very hard to try to keep as many patients within our community as absolutely possible. Uh, does that mean that patients may be transferred from Smith County to Johnson City Medical Center if that's where they need to go? Yes, it does mean that. But um, we actually receive quite a few patients from Carillion and Pikeville and some of these, you know, and mission over in Asheville into our system as well. And so I, I, I don't know that physician shortage is driving necessarily all that, but it can drive uh, patients not being seen as local as we would like for them to when we've got shortages, such as urology here in Bristol right now. But remaining in the region. And but remaining in the region is a really important thing that we work very hard to do, for sure. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, if not, I, I really appreciate y'all coming. No, thank and you all so much. Update. Appreciate yes. your your good questions. Thank you. Thank all. you so much. Have a great evening. All right. Uh, so before we go into our next item, we've been going for about an hour, and our, our next item is uh, is kind of a heavy topic. So we are going to take a ten minute recess. All right, we are back. Uh, we are refreshed and uh, hydrated and thriving. So let's move into number three. Uh, presentation from Davenport and Company. Nobody signed up for public comment, staff report. Council, uh, tonight I have uh, Roland Cooch and R.T. Taylor here with Davenport and um, Company. They have been the city's financial advisors for over 20 years. As uh, you all know and as most of the public knows, we are facing some uh, substantial costs associated with our landfill, which is going to have a significant impact on our upcoming budget as we start through this budget process. And uh, in preparation for this um, upcoming budget season, I asked Davenport to give us a um, 36,000 foot view of what our finances look like uh, as it stands right now, plus uh, what the city can do in order to um, make up lost revenue that we were losing from the landfill and then just to make up revenue to meet expenses based on the uh, costs associated with the landfill projects. So I'll turn it over to Roland and RT. Thank you, Randy. And uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here in front of you tonight. My colleague, R.T. Taylor, who's worked with me, and my other colleague, David Rose, who you've seen as well. Uh, those of you who've been here, and to your new members, uh, we uh, would welcome the opportunity to be in front of you again. And David, uh, more than likely, you might see him as well, uh, as well as R.T. in the future. But what I'd like to do is uh, RT is going to pass out this book. Uh, one thing I'd like to note is this is, you know, informational purposes only, as Rand Randy had said. Uh, where there's no action needed tonight on any of this stuff. So what what I'd like to do is go through this uh, for your for your benefit and just have you have this information as background as you come up into the um, into the budget season here for 2024. Um, I'm going to go over these first series of slides. This is sort of an overview of, of the organization of this book. It's set up in five tabs. Uh, just basically highlight what these tabs are about for the benefit. I'm not going to focus on uh, a lot of this per se, but the first tab is just an overview of Davenport and our relationship with the city over the past couple of decades. Second tab is an overview of the city's financial trends as well as upcoming budget challenges and potential 
um, perspective on revenue enhancements to address budgetary challenges. Tab three, we're going to talk a little bit about the city, city's existing debt profile, legal debt limit as well. Tab four, update on the um, timeline of the city's landfill needs, landfill project. We all know that's under a federal court order <laughs> and expected to be under a consent order by DEQ. And then tab five, uh, discuss other key projects, basically give you a, a, a 36,000 foot view perspective of other key projects, the falls, history of that, the jail, the jail decision, history to go into Southwest Virginia, Regional Jail Authority, what culminated there, as well as the, the recent school project. So um, the first couple, first section, I'm not going to uh, belabor a lot of this, but I'd like to leave you with some takeaways from each page. Uh, we have been working with the city for nearly two decades. We do this type of financial review, um, analytical support, analytical uh, work with over 200 plus Virginia cities, counties, and towns. So we are very widely represented with respect to clients throughout Virginia. Um, with our um, work with the city, uh, including the current city manager, Randy Eads, as well as the most recent chief financial officer, uh, really corresponds to the renaissance and the city's turnaround that you'll see in the next several pages. <clears throat> um, we also have played a complementary role on a variety of, of topics here, and I'd like to go through these and just sort of highlight. We assisted the city with developing and enhancing its financial policy guidelines. Also, we, we do, as a financial advisor, bring up opportunities to save money on the city's debt side, where we find those opportunities that has resulted in several millions of dollars being saved over the past many years. Um, also help with the city's uh, preparation and uh, correspondence and communication with the national bond rating agencies. You'll see the city's progress over the past 10 years in terms of the bond ratings. Um, and also um, analyze various projects we've talked about and, and mentioned in the next several pages and lastly in tab five as well. Um, brief um, sort of snippets here with respect to background on the landfill. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to point out with landfill, this was um, constructed and conceived of that predates everybody in this room in terms of council, management, and even us. Uh, just wanted to leave you that point. It's been something we've looked at from time to time throughout our relationship. We've assisted with various analyses on the landfill and sort of ideas to try to lessen the impact on the general fund. Falls Project, again, this was a project that uh, was brought to us by the city, the, pre the previous management, back in 2011-12 timeframe. We assisted the city in looking at that and really structuring that to the best of its ability to limit the obligations of, of that falls project on the city of Bristol. Bristol Jail, uh, we have been asked uh, over m uh, multiple different times and most recently updated our analysis in looking at the cost and benefits of joining the regional jail versus building a new local jail and maintaining jail uh, operations locally. So um, ultimately our analyses um, on, on every occasion concluded that joining the regional jail was more cost effective uh, than having to go out and fully fund your own local jail with your own debt and uh, maintaining those services here locally. And lastly, school capital needs. That was the most recent project we worked on. Helped analyze the financing mechanism in the PPA proposal. And uh, our analysis led to a more cost effective funding mechanism for that that was implemented last year. Um, next page, uh, it's really self-explanatory here, won't belabor the point, but the city's credit ratings are at the highest level in over a decade. Uh, right now highlighted in the yellow boxes, they stand at A2 by Moody's and A plus by S&P, and right now the city does not have a Fitch rating. Those are the three major uh, rating agencies that rate mo local governments throughout the United States. On the next page, you could see the uh, rating trends. And as we've talked about, really over the past decade, the past 10 years, um, <clears throat> the city's credit ratings have, have risen to the highest points they are today. And that culminator begins, started ar around the Renaissance timeframe we're talking about, when the new management team at that time, Mr. Eads and Tamara Spradlin, really helped push the financial management and focus of budget, structural budget into 
uh, into continued practice. On the next page, uh, tax anticipation notes. When we started working with the city of Bristol, it was constantly doing tax anticipation notes to really we call these quote unquote payday loans because you have to borrow to meet your obligations until the revenues come in. So the good thing we want to point out here, these tax anticipation notes around 2017 started to hit the lowest point. By FY 2018, they went away completely. And I think that's a really key, uh, nice driver there. So on tab two, this is um, what you've just heard is really how the city turned itself around, really is working hard to really do the right things with respect to best practices, financial policies, um, analytical approaches to funding its needs, and, and really reducing the reliance on tax anticipation notes, building up uh, and relying less on, fund, on, uh, on that kind of uh, what we'll call uh, short-term financing for, for cash flow. But what we wanted to go through in this tab two is the city's financial trends and upcoming budget challenges. Again, a high level perspective, and we'll focus a little more on these slides coming up in the next several pages. So this slide, there's a lot of information on this slide. What I'd like to do is uh, talk about uh, certain high level pieces here on these top two bullets and then really tell you in the slide what, this, what these data points mean. Um, in 2017 and prior, prior to that, the city's budget was structurally what we call unbalanced. That is to say, the city, as long as we can remember, and we've, we've done many different analyses and sort of um, developed plans, and I can remember going back to as early as 2003, 4, 5, when we had the Great Recession in 2008, the sort of uh, tipped the scales the wrong way again, then we developed another plan after that, but really trying to get the city going into what we call structural balance, where the recurring revenues meet recurring um, expenditures. And prior to 2017, basically prior to that, was where we had the opposite. We had recurring expenditures that were greater than recurring revenue sources. So uh, available fund balance, and you saw in the tax anticipation note slide, that's why we had to do a lot of those revenue anticipation notes. We just didn't have, um, one, the fiscal strength there, the fiscal resources, but also we had these budgets that were out of balance. By the time we moved into 2018 with Randy and Tamara at the time, city council at the time made a concerted effort to move into balanced and focused on balanced budgets. Um, city staff and city councils really moved to adopting those budgets through um, council's leadership as well. And um, the increasing results from that, the results from that you could see and can be seen in the increasing fund balance that's left over at the end of every year in the audit. And what this slide shows you down at the bottom is that <clears throat> when we move past 2017 and move into the structural balanced budgets of 2018 and thereafter, we can see that we moved into a position where fund balance was increasing, unassigned fund balance of uh, 8.3 million in 2017, but you can see it moves to 14.2 and increases there every year thereafter. What that does is that allows you to get rid of the tax anticipation of borrowings, provides enough cash resources and enough emergency resources that the city doesn't have to worry about uh, funding its monthly expenditures. And then also, um, it, this is a testament to and evidence of a best practice that local governments are recommended to follow as having adequate resources and fund balance, adequate cash in, and liquidity in the system to sustain governmental operations on a year in and year out basis. Um, <clears throat> this is not only something we preach, this is the rating agencies, all three rating agencies we just talked about, as well as a GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, at the state level, Virginia, as well as the national level as well. So this is a critical aspect of good, good government, good, good budgeting practices, good fiscal health. 
Um, one other point I'd like to m m note and, and also compliment the city on, in FY21, for the first time it received, the city received the GFOA's Certificate of Achievement in Excellence for Financial Reporting. I think all of that sort of culminates in the good work that, is, that has been pushed, moving in this right direction. So part of this, um, part of the city's financial practices that's built in is financial policy guidelines. And you can see then in um, the charts on the left show the relationship of the unassigned fund balance as a measurement of the, the city's revenues, and actually the, the dollar amount below there. But you can see where the ratio is, and that's the policy. What is the ratio of fund balance, unassigned fund balance, to the revenues? And what is our policy, which says our target that we're supposed to keep a bare minimum of, that's approximately set at about 18%. Now I'll tell you, that is a target that is um, about what is this, the base level of recommendation by GFOA. Generally, two months worth of operating expenditures are recommended as a starting point, but it's important to note that the policy recommendation of two months should be taken in context with every local government's unique situation and circumstances. Uh, some local governments, as the smaller you get, or I'm saying even smaller than Bristol, may need more because the actual dollar amount for un unforeseen circumstances or emergencies could be, could be rather large in today's environment. Uh, the largest of local governments, if you look at Fairfax, um, you know, Nashville is a big one in Tennessee out west, um, you know, the Virginia Beach, the largest of ones may not need that 18% plus in that range, but it's always a good practice to think about that as a starting point and it could be adjusted, um, you know, up as needed, you know, based on the local government circumstances. The, the credit rating agencies, if I'd like to leave you with uh, a commentary here, is the credit rating agencies look at 18% as kind of a, a median level, but for rating categories in the A rating and higher, generally they say having a stronger fund balance really offsets and really is to the benefit of local government. Um, Roland, let me sure. interrupt you real quick. You know, I did talk about the landfill specifically, but there's also a lot of other stressors on our general fund that are upcoming. And um, Roland is going to talk about some of the operational expenses that we're going to have in the city going forward, uh, along with just necessary items that uh, the city needs in order to operate efficiently. So not only is it our, do we have these what I will say, one-time expenses with the landfill. We've also got recurring expenses with the landfill. Plus, we also have recurring normal general fund expenses that we have to take into account as well. So, sorry to interrupt. No problem. Randy, you, you've sort of foreshadowed the next several pages that we're going to talk about here. Um, after we talked about the fund balance concept here, that's one-time monies, but they're really designed to help provide reserves. It's kind of like a, a bank account to help you cash flow. But as Randy said, talking about um, upcoming budgetary challenges here, both from an operational side and a capital side. Now, fund balance is not something that can be addressed or used from an operating budgetary challenge, because what you, that operating budgetary challenge is something that's going to be recurring. Fund balance is one-time dollars. Once you use it, it's gone. Um, so from an operational standpoint, the things we're talking about here are the things that are challenges for the city to think about in FY24 and beyond. Um, police vehicles and fleet. We're seeing a lot of that in local governments. Bristol's not unique here. Local governments have a continual need to renew their fleet, and police vehicles are playing an important part of that in the city of Bristol. Right now, the city in the current 23 budget has about 320,000 budgeted for replacement of those vehicles. Um, the city anticipates really to get into a replacement mode and a maintenance of those vehicles so as they don't fall behind on them. We anticipate needing somewhere between 500 to 750,000 in that range, not only in FY23 because those requests are coming up and those vehicles are not getting any newer, but going beyond and for purposes in perpetuity. Just think about it in terms of a fleet of cars. You don't want all of them to be replaced at one time. You just have to continue replacement, sort of a steady state of replacement. And that's what that, that level is designed to get you. 
from the school standpoint, um, schools funding, um, the, the Commonwealth is one of the, is the largest, is the, the largest, uh, biggest component of non-local revenues coming to school systems. And Bristol Public Schools receives Commonwealth support. But along with that Commonwealth support of, for education, they require a local contribution, sort of a, a mandated local contribution, so required local support to fund education. To give you perspective, this is continuing to rise um, as costs go up, as operation, uh, operations of schools go up. Um, this number um, will be seen to be increased and put pressure on the city's local budget for schools. Um, in looking at FY 2022, the contribution, just thinking about it from that perspective, the city was required a local contribution was 6.6 .6 million. So if you look at that number, then in FY22, that was what the city contributed. And if you look at the required local minimums calculated by the Department of Education, again, this is not something that the locality, we don't calculate it, the locality doesn't calculate it, this is the DOE calculating it, saying to match our funds, we're requiring you to increase that contribution over time. So we're, we're anticipating, <clears throat> or we've seen that the increase to that local contribution to the public schools went up about uh, almost a million dollars. It went from 6.6 .6 to 7.5 in 2023. And it's ex expected or anticipated, projected to go up to about 8 million in 2024. So that's the number that has to come from the local side. The schools may be getting increased Commonwealth side, but those two go together to fund the school system itself. <coughs> Moving on to additional operational challenges. Um, one of the important points that we want to talk about here is even after closing the landfill, after terminating operations there, cl uh, closing the landfill and just ceasing operations there, um, the city does anticipate that annual operations and maintenance expenses will continue to increase annually. It's, the landfill is unique in that it's not one of those things that you could just say, we closed it, it's done, it's in a box, it's over. There's gonna be ongoing. And I just wanna reiterate here, and I hate to jump in like mm -hmm. this, but I've lived this for two years now, and the maintenance costs associated with the projects that we have ongoing out there right now are not going to be cheap over the next five to 10 years because it's gonna require continuous maintenance just as Roland says, once we close this landfill, it's, it just doesn't go away. I mean, there's things that are going to have to be continually done on a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, and annual basis that are required by DEQ, and they have to be monitored, plus all the projects that we've done have to be maintained. And then I also want to stress, even the projects we're doing now, there may be additional projects in the future that we haven't even contemplated yet, nor have the experts contemplated yet. So there, there's a tremendous amount of financial pressure on the solid waste disposal fund going forward. Thanks, and, and as I've said, Randy, you, you said the exact words. It's something that requires continual, what I'll call maintenance and supervision and really being on top of, because it is something that, as I said, is mandated, it's uh, required by DEQ in terms of regulatory issues. Um, Looking at the jail, we looked at, and when you look at these numbers here, this is part of the analysis that resulted in the city joining the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail. Um, <clears throat> the, the estimated cost expect to incur about $3.1 million annually going forward. Now, when we did our analysis, and we've got that analysis, I think there was a public document back in 2021, if I remember correctly. Um, that analysis didn't say you're going to reduce costs going to the regional jail. It said you're going to avoid even greater costs if you did not go to the regional jail. So this, um, this is a, a fact that, that we, did dis we did talk about. We said that costs are going to increase related to being a part of the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail. They're just not going to be extremely high. They're, they're going to increase, though, going forward. What we anticipate or what is projected going forward is that the cost will be about 3.1 million. 
in, in the near term, FY 2024 and going forward. Um, right now, of that 3.1 million, about 1.8 million is funded currently in the budget. That leaves um, essentially 1.3 million of new costs having to be absorbed or built into the budget going forward. Um, this, the, the, the key benefit of not having, uh, of, I'm sorry, of going to Southwest Virginia Regional Jail, and you can see it in our other analysis, is that it avoided tens of millions of dollars in having to build a new jail facility, which would be on top of the operational costs of that jail facility. So that's the key benefit here. Um, other budgetary pressures. Uh, operationally, we're looking at um, the city's anticipating legal fees to continue roughly at 250000 per month for the foreseeable future. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, um, the operational side of personnel, salaries, health care, maintenance, and other miscellaneous expenditures in support of city services are also expected to increase uh, due to inflation and, and growth. I mean, we're in right now unfortunately one of the higher inflationary environments that we've been in in the past 20 years. So from a capital standpoint, these are one-time expenditures I'm going to talk about here with respect to budget challenges. The landfill, and we'll get into more detail in section four, an update and timeline on the city's landfill project, um, the remediation <coughs> efforts uh, with respect to landfill, are anticipated or projected to cost, at least right now, preliminarily $60 million. Um, <clears throat> this is not a discretionary project. This is a project uh, for which the city is under a federal court order and is also expected to be operating under a consent order by the Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ, to complete the remediation of the landfill by calendar year end 2023. Um, we all know 60 million is an estimate at this time. Wanted to just caveat that. As the project continues to uh, unfold and kind of con commence along the course of calendar year 23, these costs will come into greater clarity as their <clears throat> components are bid out. Um, looking at the jail, the utilization of the local jail is expected to be discontinued. There may be, um, when we think about it, maybe some wind down costs related to that facility. Um, with respect to the closure of it, the full closure of it, as well as uh, potentially repurposing, not repurposing it, but we'll call raising it or, uh, or re, re, um, redoing that entire area of the city with respect to that, that facility. Those costs are yet to be determined. Other budgetary pressures, um, a new accounting system, when we look at that, that context, um, one of the important things to be said is you can never have um, uh, I'm not never put it this way. A new accounting system controlling the finances and allowing you to understand where your financial position is is one of the most important pieces of what we'll call infrastructure in the city that it could have. Um, police and fire vehicles, we already mentioned the police vehicles and sort of the concept there built into the budget and recurring uh, approach of that. Um, looking at fire vehicle replacement as well as they may come as they come down the line um, and the needs for those as well as personnel additions uh, looking at uh, city attorney the city system assistant city manager um, assistant public works director amongst other um, clerical and accounting positions really all what we'll call um, infrastructure of human re human capital human uh, resources that are needed to keep a government running uh, at efficient, efficient manners. So we talked a, um, about the operational and capital budgetary pressures. What we wanted to talk about next are how can potentially those be addressed. Uh, future potential enhancements to revenue sources, one of which is the state gaming revenues related to the, the Hard Rock Casino. Um, the city anticipates receiving about 600000 per year initially in FY 2024 and 2025. Again, this is related to the state gaming revenues that are going to come to the city as a result of that. Uh, commencing in 2026 and beyond, this is when the new facility, the full casino, is going to be up and running. Um, the, the city expects these to, to increase to about $1.44 annually. 
So that's a, that's a nice benefit there. When we look at that, those are revenue sources that may be considered to be applied to a combination of operational and capital <coughs> needs that we just discussed. The other major revenue driver here when we think about it is um, real estate and taxable value of real estate. Um, just a background here, as of January 2021, the city went through a reevaluation of its assessed value <clears throat> on which it collects real estate taxes. Um, the city did equalize its real property tax rate um, such that there was no net incremental or new incremental revenue generated as a result of that assessed valuation. So that's, that's something what we call equalization of revenues. So really you're not left with a benefit of the increase in that, that assessed value generating new tax revenue there. Um, the revaluation occurs every four years. So that's something that can be factored into or can be considered when the next opportunity to potentially capture incremental revenues in terms of growth in the real estate um, not equalizing would allow that sort of capture and kind of new revenues to come to the general fund to help address some of the operational side and or capital side. Um, alternatively, between revaluations, the city can, can effectively change the property tax rate ahead of the revaluation. So the city does have some tools at its disposal to create new revenues to help offset some of these um, expenditure pressures. Um, <clears throat> One thing that, to note here is that um, with the city experiencing incremental growth uh, in its tax base or steady growth in its tax base, there's sort of a dual impact there of trying to capture the benefit of that growth, but potentially if we adjust the, rev the, the tax rate, can get a little bit of a double impact there. Um, what is the impact in terms of uh, those new revenue sources and what we've shown on this page there's more detail in Appendix A, but what we wanted to do is show what the impact is on a variety of revenue sources and how those may be impacted um, to the general fund and or to the public as well, because the public is, is part of the, uh, the, the equation here. You're taxing the, the taxable real value, uh, either of a resident, a business owner, or a traveler when it comes to transit. Um, lodging taxes and, and or meal taxes. So what we've done here is we've tried to break it down into increments that, is very, that, are, that are relatively easy to follow in terms of real property on that first uh, four series of lines there. If we were to look at the net taxable value, um, the equivalent of every $100,000. So if you have a $100,000 home, and if we looked at the annual impact of one penny increase on that $100,000 home, if you look at column B, that annual impact is $10 per year. Now, if you we further translate down to a monthly impact, that's an 83%, 83 cents per month equating to that. So just to show you what that does in terms of the, the incremental change to the tax on that, on that uh, property owner, that's what that d means per every $100,000. Now, to the general fund, one penny provides almost $123,000 in recurring revenue. So one penny is a very powerful, um, per very powerful tool from a general fund standpoint when you look at these columns on these uh, tax revenues, these local tax revenues that are highlighted in the blue. And we'll talk about the, the two bottom ones that are in the green as well. So we did the exact same thing for personal property. So assuming a net taxable value of about $25,000, if we did an annual impact of one penny on that $25,000, that's about $2.50 per year. Again, $0.21 cents per month. But to the general fund, that's almost $12,000 on a recurring basis. M&T. Um, looking at a net taxable value, and again, there's a, there's a taxable ratio there, so it's not a dollar for dollar in terms of assessed value, but assuming we can get a net taxable value of $30,000 based on the M&T that's, that's there in a business, then an annual impact of one penny is $3, $3. and again, translating that back down to monthly, it's about $0.25 cents per month. 
that, that's a little bit less in terms of revenue generator to the general fund, about $2,800 a year. So it's not as quite a big number um, as the top two categories. Um, again, FF&E &E, and then mobile homes, the same concept here. We still translated it down into one penny on a annual as well as a monthly basis. And again, we're looking at um, smaller amounts incremental to the general fund. So I think the key takeaway here is going from top to bottom, real estate taxes is the biggest driver of your local revenues there in terms of tax revenues, and then personal properties right behind that. Now, when we look at a couple of other what we'll call more um, transient occupancy or trans, uh, more impactful to not only residents in Virginia, but tourists who come through, travelers who come through. Um, stayed last night in Bristol, so meals and lodging, you know, that's, um, that's travelers coming through, contributing to that. When you look at the impact of 1% on the tax rate on those meals and lodging taxes, looking at it on the lodging tax, every incremental impact or every incremental 1% is about 200,000 per year. And if you look at the meals tax, every incremental 1% is about 900,000 per year. So, so those are a couple of different things there you can think about. And those can be adjusted if you think about it from a half percent. You just divide those numbers by two, you get about 100, 105,000, maybe about 400, 460,000 on the other one. So going to, to tab three, a discussion about the city's existing debt profile. We have talked and presented a lot of this, um, very uh, presented it a lot in the past, and we continue to be on top of this and will present, like to present about this as well from an educational standpoint. Um, <clears throat> the city's debt profile, and this is estimated as of six, June 30 of 2022, uh, we're talking about um, approximately $130 million of debt. Um, when we look at this, it consists of about $105 million of general obligation bonds and about $24.5 million of lease revenue bonds issued through the IDA. That was specifically issued for the school plan of finance in, um, in fiscal year 2022. Um, we separated out this way because there are some nuances with respect to legal debt margin that only apply to general obligation bonds. So we wanted you to have that background. And you could see all of those series of general obligation bonds listed on the right in that table, totaling up to about the 105. And then that lease revenue bonds is only one series of bonds there related to the schools. So what does the debt service look like from a payment standpoint? So the city's debt service is relatively level if you look at this chart and kind of eyeball that line, it from FY 2023 to about FY 2024 and thereafter, there's a small jump up of 23 to 24, um, going from 6.9 million to about 7.4 million. That in and of itself adds to the budgetary pressures because that's a debt service increase. But it's relatively level when you look at that thereafter. In FY 2025, the first payment on the lease revenue bonds begins. So that does not, is not going to hit in 24, but that's going to hit in 25. Based on all the guidance from the schools, all the, um, the um, presentations back and forth and analysis <coughs> that the schools provided, the project being financed, this is a consolidation of the two schools into the new elementary school, was designed to create budget efficiencies that schools is indicating can be used to offset this debt service. So legal debt margin, if you'll recall, we talked about the geo debt at um, about 105 million. That lease revenue debt does not apply to this legal debt margin calculation. The key takeaway to this page is the city has nearly 30 million of legal debt margin, which means that the city can issue upwards of 30 million of general obligation bonds within the statutory Code of Virginia that's permitted by the Code of Virginia. That is, <clears throat> that permit, the, the calculation you can see here is uh, the Code of Virginia caps your 
outstanding general obligation indebtedness to 10% of the taxable value of real estate. So the city has about 30 million within that 10% range based on um, projected debt outstanding as, um, as late as December of 2022, that number's about 30 million. So on the next series of slides, um, I'd like to go give you an update and timeline on the city's landfill project. And um, we can give you a little bit of background here, sort of a historical perspective um, before we get into the update and the timeline. Really prior to 2004, and as I've said earlier in this presentation about the landfill, this pre the landfill predates us all and, and really goes back to the mid 90s. Um, from a planning standpoint, and was funded initially in 1998 with general obligation bonds. So that's how far back this goes. It goes, you know, prior to Mr. Eads, prior to the city manager, prior to him, really back to a couple of city managers, back in city councils, back into the, the mid-90s. Um, investment occurred via loans from the general fund. Primarily, when we looked at um, the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, the city's fund balance wasn't nearly as strong. It was struggling from year to year. That was due to investment of landfill debt as well as loans from the general funds that continued to go into solid waste funds. Um, the city was supporting the landfill through that, through its uh, general fund, through the, um, the general fund operations. Um, the landfill continued to be a drain on the general fund at that time. Um, and really culminated in our cash flow analysis. One of the first times we, we really took a hard look at this was looking at the cash flow and budgetary analyses back in the early 2000s um, up into basically the mid 2000s to really kind of develop a strategic plan of finance and kind of a budgetary adjustment program to adjust operational revenues to be consistent with operational expenses. First time bringing in, kind of really pushing towards structural balance. Um, the city was on board with that at the time, but really we had the Great Recession that really threw things for a loop at that time and really kind of threw things out of kilter at that, at that point again. Um, as a result of that Great Recession in um, 2008, time frame. In 2009, we again did the same work, same task to really kind of bring it forward and really kind of go in the right direction again. Um, and that was um, moving in the right direction. And then um, 2011, new project, The Falls, which we'll talk about as well, came, came about at that time. Um, in 2011, at the same time the city was considering The Falls, they, the city requested for us to take a look at with some, with some um, engineering experts as well as legal experts as to what could be done with a landfill. Um, the team that we had was basically Davenport, Arcadis, a big consulting engineering firm um, that's widely, widely respected in terms of solid waste, as well as Sands Anderson, a, a bond council firm at the time as well, to look at the landfill, to kind of look at that. We came up with really um, the, the process to evaluate either selling the landfill or um, enhancing landfill operations. What can we do? What needs to be done there to really right the ship? Um, at the time, the recommendation from Arcadis, if you can't sell the landfill, one was first to try to divest, but if you couldn't do that, the recommendation was to fill it up as fast as you can because it's a quarry landfill below grade and basically just catching, catching water. It's a water catch basin. Um, in 2018, one thing I'd like to note before we get to the next slide, in 2018 and 19, um, the city, through the efforts of the city manager, again, tried to sell the landfill, again, not having any takers due to a wide variety of competition and alternate resources out there. On the next page, <clears throat> up to and including the 23 budget, by the time we get to here, the city did subsidize the landfill <laughs> operations with monies from the general fund. Uh, in FY 2022, that subsidy um, was about 1.9 million to supplement the solid waste fund. By FY 23, um, the city's a budget, uh, adopted budget at that time included a general fund transfer of one and a half million. Uh, but that, again, was before the landfill continued to evolve in the wrong direction 
uh, at that point, that one and a half million. Um, based on discussions with uh, staff, the actual transfer to FY23 is uh, maybe more than likely to be higher than budgeted, that one and a half million dollar number. Um, <clears throat> the next point we'd like to note here is that as a result of um, the federal, the court order and what we're anticipating to be under uh, DEQ uh, consent order, uh, the city um, had two landfills. The first one, um, landfill 498, was, was ceased in, in the early 2000s, but the one we're talking about here is the Quarry Landfill. Um, that operation ceased on September 9th of 2022. And um, you know the closure of these landfills is again not one of the things. One of the things why it's 60 million. One, it's a unique landfill. It's a quarry landfill. But also, closure of these landfills are dictated by regulators, um, as well in regulations in the Virginia uh, Administration Code, as well as the DEQ. So again, it's not just something that's simply you know let's throw some you know very quick fix to it, close it, and call it a day. It's a very complicated process. Um, as a result of ceasing operations and accepting waste, the city has contracted with uh, another landfill, other landfill for solid waste disposal. So that's, that's expenses that are built into as well. On the next page, um, a little bit of a description, kind of getting into the high level numbers of what the 60 million is comprised of. Um, Closure costs associated with the landfill are approximately $26.5 million, consisting of an estimated $20 million to close the quarry landfill and about $6.5 million related to the closure of the old landfill, sort of additional costs there. Additionally, the remediation part of this, sort of once you close it, but you've got to remediate <coughs> as well, remediation part of the process is expected to be in the range of about $33.5 million. So these are, these are the estimated numbers at this time. Um, again, we, um, we do know the city's requested or asked the Commonwealth of Virginia for assistance and uh, should receive notice, hopefully, of any approved amounts, if any, by the end of February of 2023 to help buy down this, some of these costs. Um, as the project continues on through the calendar year 23, the actual costs in the state funding will be known, become clearer, so that plays in part to kind of the next several pages in the corner of kind of our recommendation on addressing the landfill. Um, looking at this, um, we know the $60 million is a big number, and that's going to occur over the course of the next um, 12 months easily. Um, the city may want to consider some element of interim financing in order to begin and continue the spending as we go forward in the coming months and start the closure process. Um, the interim financing, really the key benefit here is we know, we know we don't have enough cash to address this. And we know that spending all of our cash in the fund balance side is detrimental to the city. That just puts you back to being in a position of not having the funds to operate. So we can't, we can't do that. So we, what, we're, what we're saying the interim financing would allow is time for the project to evolve as the actual costs become clear, again, we'll know that over the course of the next 6, 12 months. Great grant funding, state funding, if any, will become clear, hopefully by the end of February. We'll hear some good news on that. And then what we would recommend doing is developing a strategic plan of finance to identify the appropriate balance of cash, because we know there is some fund balance in above your policy, but we wouldn't we would want to analyze the balance of use of some of that fund balance, not using all of it to get your policy down, but balance of use of some of that, as well as the permanent debt financing sources that would have to be uh, issued in order to fully fund the closure and remediation process. That's going to take some time and really comes into clarity as these costs become clear and unfold over the next several months. So. What we also wanted to do is just put into perspective here um, a number just to give you a sense of what, what it would, a recurring cost would be, a recurring debt service would be on an amount borrowed. So based on a project amount borrowing, a funding of about $30 million via debt, through debt, and if we're assuming a fall of 2023 
issuance. That is, by the sometime before the end of this calendar year, as the landfill costs become known, as we know what the timing is and everything, um, an issuance in that time frame, um, that would involve a potential partial interest payment in FY24, and it's down in this table below, and if we assume a 20-year financing term, we've actually calculated the estimated debt, service, estimated debt service that would be incurred on an ongoing basis for 20 years after that. So you can get a perspective of what that number is. And again, this is based on a $30 million number to fund with, with bonds, and also on today's current market interest rates. We did run a sensitivity that if the interest rates do increase another half a percent from today, or another 1% from today, which you can see what that variance is as well. You can kind of get a perspective of that. What I'd like to point out to you is in the first column under scenario one, the current market, is if we're assuming a $30 million financing over 20 years and this time frame, the all-in cost is expected to be just over 4%. This is um, higher than we've seen in the past couple of years, but this is assumed to be uh, tax exempt, and we could have a little bit of adjustment to the tax status there, but generally this assumes a tax exempt bond, uh, if we could do it all tax exempt, at 4%. And then if we look at the number for, for 2024 interest only, that's about 700, just shy of 750,000 in terms of interest expense. Full payments of principal and interest begin in 2025 and then continue for 20 years. That, that would result in about a 2.2 million um, debt service payment to fund 30 million if we had to fund that from a closure cost standpoint. Total debt service is in blue, that's total principal and interest. But the, the thing I'd like to leave you with is the annual cash flow or budgetary impact is line five, four and five. Now, if rates go up half a percent, just look at lines four and five to scenario two, and you could see that the number of 750 goes to a little over 815,000, and that number for annual debt service increases by about 100,000. So the impact of half a percent increase in rates moves that number up about 100,000, and if we increase a full percentage points in rates, moves the number up by about 200,000 per year on a, on a going basis. So next steps and timeline on the landfill, what we would anticipate and what we, what we know here is that engineering bids are received, contracts awarded for the contracts as they get started around February 23. Um, we think prudent to adopt a reimbursement resolution. Um, those of you on council who've been through a debt, debt issuance before, we often recommend reimbursement resolutions in that it allows the, um, the council to, re to uh, finance costs that have been expended. Doesn't mean you have to, but it just gives you the flexibility, again, to balance out your total sources of, of equity and debt. Um, that would allow you to recapture any monies that you spent if you, if you want to recapture those and maintain that fund balance target um, in that perspective. Um, Hopefully, we'd hear as well, uh, February of 23, in that time frame, how much money is the Commonwealth may be, may be interested in providing or may be able to provide, if any, in that amount. So the interim financing then, we'd recommend starting on or about March, April of 2023. Again, this is providing the funding. It's not the full funding of that 30 million we saw, but it's an amount that allows you to spend on this project as we go through the balance of the summer and into the fall, as all these costs become clear, that interim financing then could be converted to a permanent financing. And uh, that permanent financing then would be going forward, taking care of the, any amounts not funded from combination of grants, if any, from the Commonwealth or, or, um, or equity um, being you know, funded by the city from, from cash reserves. Um, in conjunction with the permanent financing, what we would, we would recommend and what we'd be working hand in hand with the city is the strategic plan of finance, not only in the bond side, but really developing the, the, the projections, the credit rating um, agency presentations, because this is going to be an impact 
on potentially the uh, city's credit rating. It's an additional debt burden. The rating agencies are going to take that into consideration. We want to develop and we want to balance this out and develop a strategic plan that does its best to minimize any potential negative impact to the city's hard-earned credit ratings because we, that allows you to access the credit markets at the, at the cost of funds you can access at very, very good cost of funds as well. So other key projects, um, just going over kind of the highlight of the falls, there's a lot on here you could read, but what I wanted to point out, a couple of key bullets here, is that in 2012, the city made a decision that it had to do something, and the falls project was critical to stemming loss of revenues to the decline of the existing mall in the city. Um, originally, um, those revenues were estimated to be upwards of $2 million a year. So the city said, faced, faced with that sort of loss of revenues, the city looked at the falls as a potential offset to that. Originally, the Falls project was contemplated in a city investment not to exceed $25 million. That um, did unfold, and as it unfolded, it got larger and larger and larger. Um, one of the points that we, we wanted to be clear about, there are a couple of points in time that Davenport recommended take, putting the brakes on this, but with a, a conjunction of developer and city decisions to that point, um, they, the city felt that it had to proceed forward at that time. Um, ultimately, uh, the city and the IDA, we're long, talking about the total debt kind of related to the falls. Um, when you combine those two general obligation bonds as well as the IDA revenue bonds, that's about 86.3 million. And if you look at how that's break, broken down, the city's geo bonds approximated about 52 million. So it really doubled that $25 million initial investment, turned it into about a $50 million initial investment. Um, I have to say that the bulk of it, if you want to talk about it from that perspective, was land acquisition and site work. So when we look at the, the balance of that, the IDA revenue bonds, 34 million, here's where we came into to play and said, okay, if we're going to do this, the city's going to do this project, how do we mitigate the impact of this debt on the city? Of that 34 million, the only responsibility that the city has legally is on six and a half million of that debt. The other 27 and a half million are repaid directly from phase one revenues and are what was called non-recourse to the city. So if the revenues are insufficient, the city does not have any obligation to make those bonds whole. Over the past several years, uh, one of the good things is developments continued, albeit a little bit slower than anticipated, it was originally anticipated or projected or thought of by the city at that time. But new tenants have come into the Falls project as a whole, so both inside phase one as out and outside of phase one. So that's been to the benefit of the city over the, over the recent years. Um, in FY 2022, just an update there, uh, the most recent completed year, um, looking at the, th talking about the 36 and a half million, those IDA revenue bonds, that's what this first bullet point is talking about. That 2014 A bond, that six and a half million has now been paid down to about $3 million. That's um, <clears throat> projected to be, the revenues from phase one are projected to continue to service that debt. So the city really doesn't have to kick in a moral obligation on that if the phase one revenues continue as they've been trending. And again, there's 14 B revenue bonds. There's about 27 and a half million there. That's non-recourse. If the revenues aren't sufficient, the city does not have to kick in its own general fund money for that. Just a couple of, of different items there on phases two and three. Uh, revenues from phases two and three in FY 2022 were budgeted about 750,000. And at that time that we looked at it, um, they were about 51% of budget. So they were performing on budget at that point. So the Bristol Jail, uh, just to give you some background on the Bristol Jail, over the past two decades, and this goes back to the inception of the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail Authority, um, the city has been approached by Southwest Virginia 
to be a part of the uh, regional jail. And originally, I want to say back in um, late 90s, early 2000s, when they were forming the task force, the city was invited to participate. But at that time, early on, we're talking about 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, the city chose to maintain course with its own local jail. So um, by the time 2012 rolled around, um, the jail facility was becoming outdated, needed lots of improvements and recommendation at that point. Um, with respect to the local, local jail was provided by <coughs> Mosley Architects as they talked about building a new facility or a replacement facility. Um, in 2014, we took that Mosley study and prepared an analysis, a cost-benefit analysis. Um, at that time in 2014, um, we did our analysis and it came to the conclusion that we reached in the most recent study. That is, if you could participate in the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail and not have to build your own jail at the cost of tens of millions of dollars, it's more cost effective to join the regional jail. You're going to save or you're going to save by avoiding new debt service on a, on a local jail. Um, interesting side note at that, at that point, Southwest Virginia was also expanding its facilities, and that's why they did approach Bristol at that time. And um, I think they did, I, I do remember they did offer uh, for all the deputies to join over to, so no jobs would have been lost at the time. They, they all joined, had made the offer to join um, Southwest Virginia Regional Jail's employees. The city did not go down that path at that time. In 2021, at the request of Mr. Eads, uh, and the city, we looked at um, updating the 14 analysis based on new populations, new escalation in costs with respect to capital and building uh, new jails. And again, we presented two alternatives, local alternative that involved building a new jail facility and maintaining status quo, or regional alternative, potentially joining the authorities a full member. And again, if we looked at this and based on the analysis, the same conclusion was met, only the numbers got bigger because the costs uh, got bigger in terms of, of um, building a new facility due to inflation. Um, the regional jail alternative was again shown to be more cost effective at that time. And the last slide I'll leave you with um, here is talking about the recent public schools investment. Um, in 2018, the states back to 2018, um, we reviewed a financing component that was part of a PPA proposal received by Bristol Public Schools at that time. Um, in looking at the financing component and looking at the research with respect to national bond rating agencies uh, to determine um, how the develop developer's proposed financing component would be treated and whether or not it was viable. Um, one, that financing component was so unique it's never been seen in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's a rather unique structure. Um, and additionally, number two, um, both ratings has expressed concern in that. But even if that financing was put into place, it was a more costly financing, it still would have been considered debt. So debt one way or the other, um, because it was unique and never seen, didn't mean it didn't count as debt. But it would still would have been debt. So what did we do? We looked at that as the project and discussions uh, continue to evolve on the schools. Um, the city determined with the school board collectively that the schools was a critical addition to uh, the needs of the public school system. So we took that proposal again, analyzed it, and evaluated it against other financing mechanisms um, that are offered to local governments in the Commonwealth of Virginia and throughout the United States as well. We um, recommended that because the developer's financing <coughs> was more expensive and the fact that you could never prepay it without a make whole penalty, that means you were stuck in it for 30 years, uh, we made the conclusion and recommendation that doing a financing through the IDA as lease revenue bonds would allow the city to maintain control of its own destiny with respect to that debt, could potentially refinance that debt for savings at a later date, and it was more cost effective to save the city millions compared to the developer financing at that time as well. So that's the background on the public schools investment. 
which, um, as we saw on the debt service page, that debt service kicks in and builds up and uh, starts on 2025, fiscal year 25. So the balance of the book is uh, details related to some of the calculations that we had in here on the uh, new revenue sources. I'm not going to go that into detail. And Appendix B is um, just a background on Davenport for the benefit of the new council members if you want to see a little bit about who we are and what we do. And with that, I will um, be glad to take any questions or um, turn it over to you, Randy, for any closing comments. No, I appreciate it, Roland. Uh, I think uh, he touched upon everything that we needed to talk about tonight. I think the most pressing thing that council needs to consider is one, all of the operating costs that we're going to incur over the next year associated with the landfill, not only with the landfill, just uh, operating the city in general, those types of operating costs plus capital needs and what that impact is going to mean to citizens going forward. Uh, as it stands right now, our revenue with the city is not sufficient to cover the expenses that we're getting ready to see. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this presentation. I, I am going to open it up to questions, but I, I might suggest, you know, this is a tremendous amount of information that we've received, and, um, you know, there, there are good things in this, you know, talking about our increased revenue, but there are a whole lot of um, very heavy things and very heavy um, decisions we're going to have to make. Um, it may be in our best interest that we can form well-thought-out questions. I mean, we, we can open it up now, but it might be best if we follow up with you with questions when we kind of weigh these options, you know, because these are all serious options. Um, so if anybody has any questions now, uh, we, we can do that or we can, we can wait and submit those after this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just wanted to say I don't have any, any uh, maybe specific questions right now, but I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. I think this gives us a good snapshot uh, of where we are. Um, you know where we've we've come from over the past few years, but also what we're looking at facing in the coming few years with with uh, expenses just ongoing, but also one-time expenses with the landfill, um, schools, um, you know, falls in general, debt in general. So it's um, it, it really I think helps paint a clear picture of what we're uh, facing. Certainly. I have three questions. Uh, one, I was wondering if we could get a digital form of this document. Mm -hmm. I've got that. Okay. Um, I like being able to do text searches and such. Um, and then for clarification, the uh, proposed debt on page 27, that would be general obligation, correct? Right. <clears throat> That's assumed with about 30 million of legal debt margin, you can issue about 30 million of, of general obligation debt. Um, there are, as the schools did issue lease revenue debt, there are other mechanisms to issue additional debt if you need to under a lease revenue approach. Um, and the third question, on page 26, you were uh, recommending to consider interim financing. Um, I don't see the recommendations concerning how to handle that. Am I overlooking it? We didn't get into those details in this presentation. We just recommended the concept and laying the groundwork for that. Uh, we would think we would we would come back at additional council meeting to talk about the, the the analysis for it, the need for it, the estimated concept or timing of it, as well as the amount. Um, the interim financing, as we know the spending unfolds, the interim financing is a combination of how much you need to cash flow offset by any potential assistance from the Commonwealth, if any, and when that might occur. So I think it's premature to have that in here. We just recommended that considering interim financing at the right time will help you maintain the project continuity. And then at the time that we, we see, we understand where the, the project is going to uh, lay, lay out in terms of unfold with respect to all the costs, then you balance out what you're going to finance permanently with what you can, you know, you can structure and maintain in terms of cash reserves that you need to hold. So conceptually speaking, anyway, this would basically be a short-term note in order to get us until the fall. Uh, likely Correct. at a high rate, but for a short period of time, which would then be refinanced 
into the long-term note at a lower rate. Correct, because we, I mean, doing the long-term financing in, as soon as you can, you might undershoot that in terms of the amount, you might overshoot that in terms of the amount. So it's better to do the interim financing to kind of give you the cash flow, and then once we have clarity on all the project needs, um, I mean, if, if, if by example that 60 becomes 55, you know, we wouldn't have to issue as much potentially. Um, so that's, that's sort of the considerations that we would know that would unfold over the balance of the year. Is there, trying to think outside the box here, is there any way to leverage whatever value that we consider in the, the property of the landfill or its equipment and what have you in order to have this as a, um, uh, a capitalized loan. As such, we may be able to um, potentially borrow a larger amount than our current debt limit would allow because it would be balanced against <coughs> the capital value. I, I think... You can't borrow over our legal debt limit. Our, our In... legal debt limit set by the uh, Constitution and by statute, so we're, we're with, bound by what our... With geo bonds. With geo bonds, yes. that's right. With, with if, if, for example, let's say <clears throat> you needed to do 40 million. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, could do, we know we can do 30 with geo bonds. That additional 10 million could be issued in the same mechanism, under the same mechanism that the school bonds were issued. As a lease revenue bond. As a lease revenue bond, yes. And, and you don't necessarily need to have, in today's market, a asset to collateralize that. We can issue subject to appropriation bonds, more obligation based on the city. Um, ideally, sometimes you might have to have an asset to help, help the rate, but we've seen, we've seen bonds issued on a subject to appropriation basis without an asset. So. The other thing is um, the landfill is an asset to back the bonds typically is not a good financeable um, asset. It's not, not a financeable collateral piece. And I'd also add subject to appropriation, uh, the, that rate would typically probably be higher mm -hmm. than just a typical general obligation. And I don't necessarily think we want to start borrowing more than we, than we should. I don't even want to borrow $30 million, but I think it's going to be a necessity. Uh, moving forward. I'm not recommending anything. I'm, I'm just saying all options on the table. What are those options? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, so I, I will ask a couple questions. So on the landfill cost for remediation, you know, you said it was about $33.5 million. This, this might be a question for any of the three of you. Um, how will a let's say that the slide wall water mitigation system is is successful and stays on budget that that keeps us at the thirty three and a half million um, say we have to you know change course midway across the stream on that project. What do you anticipate the additional cost being? I probably can't anticipate in the, what that additional cost would be because I don't think the experts have anticipated that we would have to change course at this time. Okay. Um, so other, on the, um, on page 17, where we're talking about the impact to the general fund if we do tax increases. So talking about the lodging tax specifically. Um, I know there are other localities, you know, I've looked at, you know, like Norfolk, um, they have a, for instance, Norfolk has a $3 per night per room tax on top of their lodging tax. Just, just a flat rate of $3 per night in addition to whatever the tax is on the total. Um, do you all, could you all look at that and see how that would, would affect these numbers um, for how much could be generated from lodging tax? Because I'm just trying to think of ways to, to minimize the impact directly to Bristol citizens. Right, right. Um, yeah, we can we can take a look at that. We'd have to come back to you with that information um, using the data in terms of. Um, right, because I know that's a, that's yeah. a bigger question than you can answer now because you got to know how many, what the raw number of rooms is, you know, right. and all that. But 
you know, I, I'm trying to think of ways to limit the impact to There's our roughly 1,200 rooms in the city of Bristol, and if you did a $3 per night tax and assumed 100% occupancy rate, that's about $1.3 million. But we don't have a 100% occupancy rate, obviously. That's right. It's, yeah. And then I would also have to check that that flat room rate or that flat $3 fee may be directed to go towards um, tourism promotion. In <coughs> I'm not sure. I, I know there are localities in Virginia that do have a flat rate on lodging uh, in addition to the lodging tax, but those dollars are specifically set to go towards tourism promotion by the Virginia Code. But then it could theoretically free up the money that we're giving to tourism in the same amount where we, we could use it. You know, what, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so we'll, ha we'll have to check on that to see. And I know that's something I talked with Ms. Reinhardt about uh, probably spring of COVID year uh, doing something like that. Then everything just kind of stopped due to COVID. But we had talked about doing something like that in the future as well. Do we have any other questions? <coughs> Uh, if we have no other questions, so we will uh, we'll follow up with you. I'm, I'm going to assume that we'll come up with some more questions as we go back and read this book some more. So, okay. Thank you, Mayor uh, Osmond. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item four is a public hearing for the sale of city-owned property located on Spyglass Court. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. No one signed up for public comment. Staff report. Uh, Council, on November 7th, 2022, the city received an unsolicited offer to purchase two city-owned parcels of land located on Spyglass Court in the Clear Creek Golf Community. Map parcel numbers 121-C-1-E1 and, and number 121-C-1-E2. Pursuant to the Code of Virginia and the City Code of Bristol, Virginia, a notice of the offer and notice of this public hearing was published in the Bristol Herald Courier on December 4th and on December the 11th, 2022. Uh, offers were open through today, with January uh, 10th until 3 p.m. We've only received one offer on these parcels of property. Um, we received basically two offers within this one offer. One is an offer on lot E1 solely for $15,000 or uh, $25,000 for E1 and E2. And the um, purchaser would be building homes on both lots. Very good. As this is a um, public hearing, um, that's all you got. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, item five is discussion of Virginia Code section 46.2-882.1. No one signed up for public comment. Uh, staff report from the city manager first. Uh, our council uh, tonight, I have Chief John Austin here. He's going to discuss um, speed cameras within school zones. Uh, that's what 46.2-882.1 is about. I believe about this time last year, uh, we had a presentation by True, <coughs> True Line or True Line um, Speed. Um, True Blue. True Blue, uh, talking about cameras in school zones and that was kind of tabled at that point and no further action was taken. I believe Chief Austin has had some conversations, if not with all of you, with the majority of you in regards to this and he's here to just give you a quick update and uh, we would anticipate moving forward at the next council meeting if, if there's a majority of council here tonight it indicates a willingness to do so. All right. I'm basically here to tell you 46282 allows city or counties to enter into a uh, agreement or partnership that we can adopt the local ordinance that would allow us to put photo speed cameras in school zones or construction zones. Uh, it would also, the ordinance would have to, you as a governing body for the city would have to set the civil penalty for violation uh, of any of these speed measurements as they came through the school zones, not to exceed $100. I will tell you most jurisdictions around us, Smith County, Wythe County, Bland, Bridgewater, all these counties that are have already adopted these ordinances or so forth have set their uh, limit at $100. But more importantly, we are looking to get uh, compliance, safety compliance in our school zones for our children, for our schools. It also gives me an investigative tool that if something was to happen within the school zone, 
during school hours, because this is only active during school hours. Uh, if something was to happen, we could go back and research through the cameras or data and get some type of investigative start uh, to try to combat whatever problem or issue that may happen. So as the city manager said, we would hopefully we'd be bringing to you the next council meeting, the local ordinance and asking you at the, on behalf of the police department to adopt such ordinance for the city. All right, thank you, Chief Austin. Go ahead and open it up to uh, questions, discussion. Uh, so I just have a, a quick comment and, and maybe, you know, for, for the new guys, we'll you know, try to work to bring you up to speed. But we did speak about this last time, and I believe it was former o Officer Hogston, who was with True Blue now, who spoke about this. And we talked about it for a little bit, and then it sort of kind of kind of died. We sort of stopped talking about it. But um, I, I'll just say I, I for one, uh, am for this. Um, I mean, I think we had some numbers last time when, when Mr. Hogston was here showing, you know, roughly how many cars are going through the school zone versus how many are, are above the speed limit. I don't remember what threat, but it was quite a high number. Correct. It was, and I have these numbers, but we probably, mm -hmm. if you didn't want a new study, we could do that too. And I will say that it has to be 11 plus before you are issued a mm -hmm. civil penalty, 11 miles above. 11 plus above before you were initiated a uh, civil penalty for the dollars. One thing that I liked about the, the program was, um, you know, yes, it, it, I think, encourages people to slow down in our school zones. Um, I think we used an example one time, like the speed camera that was in Piney Flats on the way to Johnson City, and that was there for years, and y you get a speeding ticket, and now it's gone. Uh, but still, when I go through there, it's kind of ingrained in my mind. I still slow down. Uh, even though that camera's not there anymore. But um, I, I like the idea of, of trying to make sure, you know, people are following the speed limit in our school zones. But, but one big thing is um, having those cameras around the schools, using them for, for other purposes. If there was ever a child that were to go missing or, or heaven forbid, someone be abducted, those cameras can be accessed, I think, pretty quickly to, to try to help in, in figuring that out. So um, I, I didn't see any problems with it. Uh, last time, and I, I do believe some other localities are are utilizing these services. So, I, if there's anyone else that has any thoughts about any any negative side effects, I'd, I'd love to hear them. But I, yeah, I I just like to say I'm I'm open to this. I I appreciate you bringing this before us. Um, I know. Um, kind of what Councilman Farnham was saying about the, having the cameras in that location during the school hours if something were to happen. This day and age, there, there are so many problems that we're seeing in schools or, or bad situations happening, coming, or coming about. So this, that would be helpful. Um, I do kind of want to ask a very direct question, and there might be a strategically placed patrol car on my way home giving me a ticket because <laughs> of this. Um, can, can you guarantee, or how sure are you that speeding speeds would go down because of this. I know there were some numbers in the information you gave us, but how, how confident that you would, are that that would work? I, I can only, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I can only base this on other jurisdictions. And from my understanding, uh, the school systems, or they get in a compliance with it's like anywhere between 60 and 80% compliance that the speed drops within the school zones. I can get you those numbers from other jurisdictions if you like before next council meeting. I appreciate that. The, the numbers you had in the, the packet you gave us were, were great, but I just wanted to, wanted to make sure that we were pretty confident in that, so I appreciate that. Thank you. So you said that the cameras would, would be active during school hours. So I know obviously you know, the, the, the school speed limits are you know, you know, during morning drop off and evening pickup. But would the, would the cameras be active, like for the monitoring purposes, say from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. all day, or just during the morning drop off? And no, it, it's from 7 to 4, I think, okay. is what they would be active. Now, and I, and I may be mistaken, but I think the cameras are actually active uh, later on throughout that day, but not the speed measurement device. But I'd have to clarify that. So, I'm not, I, don't, I haven't seen a speed study recently for Euclid. I, I, I just wondered how, how do you think this will affect 
Euclid Avenue, you know, specifically Virginia Middle School, which is 25 anyway. Um, I don't know how many people speed on Euclid Avenue. Do you think this will, will help with people speeding down Euclid Avenue in general? I think it will slow people down during the hours. The way this thing works is they there's an educational piece that comes before everybody or uh, within the school, working with the school system. Uh, and then from that point on, there's like a 30-day warning phase where people will get a warning citation uh, if they come through that school zone. And just like Mr. Farnham said, a prime example is when you went through Piney Flats and you had the cameras there, you automatically slowed down simply because you knew they were there. And that's basically what we hope is that when you go through the school zone, you automatically slow down. Uh, the speed limit is 20, 25 down through Euclid, but I think it just by having that there was that. The other problem, not a problem, but the other issue may be out at Stonewall. You know, uh, we can set an officer in a school zone and he can write a citation for that one car that comes through. But if I have a speed monitoring device, a photo speed monitoring device, then it's going to catch every car that comes through that's speeding. And that camera is not, it, it's not within itself just the ticket. It's not just issued to you at that time. It has to come before the officer to review and see that is this a good ticket or not a good ticket. And it is based on after the, it is analyzed that this will be submitted. I'm not, I'm not going to admit to speeding when I go to Johnson City, but I do know I always went 45 specifically through Piney Flats. So, um, so one other question I, I had, you know, and this may be a may be a moot point, you know, when, once we have the Van Pelt school model that we're going to have. So some of the school zones seem to, there seems to be less rhyme or reason to, to how the school zones are set up. Like, like near Highland View, it seems to be a, a bigger circle, and you know, the, you know, you got the school zone over on Massachusetts, even though you're not near the school. So, how do, how is there a specific measurement that that we use to mark the school zones, or, or how does that work? The school zone signs have to be within 600 feet of the actual crosswalk of the or the boundary of the school property, and so it's measured 600 feet from that property. Uh, now Highland View is up on a hill. So there's not a whole lot of, uh, of effectiveness there. So that's the same as with Washington Lee because you turn off of the main thoroughfare. Where we have problems is Virginia High School, Middle School, and Stonewall Jackson. Uh, but the measuring at 600 feet is where we, the school, you see the flashing school light signs that you're now in the school zone. Um. Could you remind us, um, I know we had the presentation last year, but is there going to be any type of cost associated for the city um, for this, or how does that work? Well, and it depends on the vendor, I guess, that you, you have to go through. Then they have, sure, we have to meet the Procurement Act, or so the process. But through the vendor that we were looking at, there is no cost associated for the city yeah. at, at all they take a portion of the civil penalty that is assessed so i can't remember what portion fifteen dollars if, if it was assessed well they take fifteen dollars out of whatever you set the civil penalty for so if we set the civil penalty at fifty dollars they get fifteen we get thirty five if we set it at a hundred dollars <coughs> we get eighty five they get fifteen okay. so they're all, they're but there's no, no upfront cost but we still have to go through the procurement process and okay. if that fee is not paid the city still doesn't, they don't come back later and say you have to pay this fee for this, the city is not responsible for that fee. So that includes like the installation and everything of the cameras and? That's correct, yeah. yes. Okay. So, so what are the ramifications if someone gets one of these tickets and then just doesn't pay it? Is it, is it the same as getting a ticket from a, from a live officer? No. Basically, what happens if they get a ticket from a speed camera, they have, I think it's with 60 days to appeal it. If it's not theirs, if they're sent, for example, if I was driving your vehicle and you wouldn't, you can appeal that and go through the process to the court that it wasn't your vehicle and say who was driving it at that time. If the 
if it's not paid, my understanding that the company or the vendor that you partner with will then turn this over and goes to collections, but the city doesn't have to do that. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I do remember seeing numbers about um, what people would pay and as far as revenue coming in. And I just wanted to say, you know, someone made a comment earlier uh, about, you know, does the city really need to do this? Do they need that, really need that money? But for me, it's not really about the revenue. I, I don't even know what the number would be exactly total. But I, I do remember last year seeing, you know, the, the study saying this many thousands of cars went through the school zone and this many thousands were speeding. Um, so for me, it's just about getting people to slow down in our school zones. Yesterday morning, I saw a school bus with the red lights and the stop sign and someone actually just went right around them and, uh, you know, that's, well, that's the whole pro plan is it's really not about the money it's about making our children so mm -hmm. that that's what this whole thing is about so if we never got a dime which would be <coughs> wonderful actually mm -hmm. because that means everybody's in compliance with the with the speed limit mm -hmm. but our whole goal here is to make our school system safe or safer yeah yeah if we got zero dollars i'd still vote yes for it the whole idea with this is that over time, uh, the drivers become more and more compliant and we have fewer and fewer speeders. Do you know if there is some point at which the vendor will remove the equipment because they're, they're not covering their own costs? Could you repeat that? If the vendor would what? Remove their equipment because they're not covering their costs. No, and I think when you enter the contract that we agree to enter, leave that equipment there until such cost is covered at a, at a minimum amount of time. But if the, this takes some time to get this stuff installed, what they could, will do is enter, issue a handheld device that you can place an officer in to sit and, and do the uh, check the violations. And the officer doesn't pull that car over, it's my understanding. He would just check for speed violations just as if the camera's there until they can get that installation in. Uh, it also, if we had brought someone in on overtime basically to, to do that, it frees up that officer that I would normally have sitting in the school zone. And my understanding is the vendor would have reimbursed the city for that overtime that I had to bring an officer in to do that. I'm meaning more about on the other end. Let's say 10 years down the road, the let's using hypothetical numbers, let's say there are a thousand infractions in the, the first month. Um, but then after 10 years, there's only two speeders a month and they're getting $30 out of it. They're not covering their own costs. They're not covering their uh, data tra transfer fees and, and what have you. Is there, uh, it, are you aware that there comes some point at which they may say that this is no longer useful? I don't, I'm not aware of any, but I don't have that answer, but I'll get that answer for you. Thank you. Well, if we, uh, if we have no other questions, I'll just, you know, say it's, um, I, I think this is a good idea. I've, I've told you that privately, you know, a few times when we've talked about this, you know, it, it's it's a very hard argument to make to say, you know, we want people to speed in school zones. So, you know, it seems to make common sense, you know, that, that we want to make our school zones safer. And, you know, as Councilman Farnham said, it should not be about, you know, the money. It's it's about making our kids safe and Absolutely. making it a place where, as you know, there have been incidents, you know, like at Stonewall Jackson several years ago, you know, that you know, maybe that maybe that could not have been avoided, but if we can take every step necessary to make people as safe as we can, you know, and, and if this is a deterrent to people speeding and making it an unsafe situation, then you know, that's good. So, so thank you very much, and, uh, and we'll get back to you very soon. On thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Ken. Uh, item six is a supplemental budget appropriation totaling three hundred eighty-three thousand six hundred twenty-eight dollars. No one has signed up for public comment. Staff report. Council, uh, city staff is asking that you consider approving a supplemental budget appropriation in the amount of $383,628 with $213,620 of 
628 of that going to the general fund and the remaining $170,000 going to the <coughs> solid waste fund. So we're happy to report to you that we've received some donations in the fire department and in the police department, some generous donations. And those two departments would like for you to allow them to appropriate those monies for the purchase of equipment. $10,000 for the fire department, $10,000 for the police department. So we're very grateful to the community for those donations. In addition, we've received some recovery of overtime expenses um, in the police department of about $4,000. Those were for services they provided to Virginia High School. We've received reimbursement back for that, so we need to be able to appropriate that to that overtime expense we incurred. At the golf course, uh, during October of 2021, they issued a purchase order for a mower. And as the supply chain continues to hit us, that mower did not come in as of June 30th of 2022. So we've, they did receive that during the current fiscal year. So we just need to um, address giving, the, giving them that $19,558 in the current budget um, just to move those monies. They do have, as the city manager said earlier, they're experiencing a very healthy membership and green fees this year. Uh, really good play at the golf course. So they have the monies in the current year budget to cover the mower um, that came in this year. The last thing that we need funding for is as we've been talking about for some time now, solid waste fund. And we have numerous work orders out there with SCS. And we have work order number 2023-LF-018 and the total of $170,000. And that is for solid waste engineering and consulting services. And uh, we would ask that you allow us to appropriate $170,000 from the general fund, fund balance to transfer to solid waste. And then we would um, budget those in the solid waste fund for those professional services. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to address those. Mr. Chandler is here as, is here as well to address any specific things with um, the SCS. All right, thank you. Um, looking for a motion and a second to proceed on this. I move we approve the appropriation as presented. Second. All right, motion by Mr. Farnham, second by the Vice Mayor. Council discussion. Just for sake of clarity, since not everybody has seen these necessarily, the 170,000 for solid waste is seen here twice. So the total of 383 is seen that way, but it's actually not that much money involved, correct? Correct. It, it doubles up because you have to appropriate it within the general fund because it's a transfer from that fund into the solid waste fund. So it's really 170, not 340 as presented. And I would just like to say thank you to the United Company for those two uh, very generous donations. We appreciate that. We do, and, and yeah, I, I would echo that. And, and thank you to Councilman Pollard for pointing that out. It's important that uh, you know the public understands that, uh, that yes, this is a lot of money, but we're not spending $170,000 twice. Uh, if there's no further discussion, if the clerk would call the roll, please. Yes. 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 All right. Uh, item seven is approval to allow SCS field services to bid on IFB number SW23012, landfill gas collection system expansion stage one. No one has signed up for public comment. Staff report. Uh, Council, on December 12, 2022, the city issued an IFB for the landfill gas collection system expansion stage one that is required by the expert panel report to mitigate odors associated with the landfill. Virginia Code Section 2.24373 states, no person who for compensation prepares an invitation to bid or request for proposal for or on behalf of a public body shall submit a bid or proposal that procurement 
or any portion thereof or disclose to any bidder or offer or information concerning the procurement that is not available to the public. However, a public body may permit such person to submit a bid or proposal for the procurement or any portion thereof if the public body determines that the exclusion of the person would limit the number of potential qualified bidders or offerors in a manner contrary to the best interest of the public body. SCS Engineering prepared the IFB for the landfill gas collection system expansion stage one. However, pursuant to the above mentioned code section, SCS Field Services is prohibited from bidding on the project unless the city council determines that the exclusion of the person would limit the number of potential qualified bidders or offerors in a manner contrary to the best interest of the public body. I would ask this council to move to approve SCS Field Services to submit a bid on IF IFB number SW23-012 because it is determined to be in the best interest of the city. The reason that I would argue that it's in the best interest of the city is that we had a pre-bid conference. Five bidders showed up on December, I believe it was the 15th, was the day of that pre-bid conference. Um, since that time, there has been no communication between potential bidders and the engineering firm, which is concerning to the engineering firm that no one has reached out to them about further specifications as it relates to the uh, gas collection system. And um, we feel like it, there could be a potential that there would not be any bids. So in order to uh, make sure we have at least one bid in order to, con 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 in order to continue the projects at the landfill, we think it's in the best interest of the city to allow SCS field services to move. All right, thank you. Uh, looking for a motion and a second. Uh, so I, I move to approve the SCS field services to submit a bid on IFB number SW23010 because it is determined to be in the best interest of the city. Can you clarify your motion? Uh, I think you misspoke on the IFB number. Okay, uh, yes, sorry, IFB number SW-23-012. Thank you. So we have a motion and we're looking for a second. I'll second. second. Oh, sorry, go ahead. She beat me to it. She beat yeah, you to it. it. It's all, all right. right. So we have a... Um, Motion by Mr. Farnham and a second by everybody, by, by the vice mayor. Uh, council discussion. As much as I like to expand the, the amount of competition, this is important that we get it done. And if SCS is the only qualified bidder or most likely based on what we've seen to be the only qualified bidder, we've got to get the landfill fixed. And, and to, to add on that, just for clarity for people who are here, here in the room or listening at home, basically if, if we don't do this and the, uh, the bid window closes, we'll have to re reopen it for a, another extended period of time. It'll, it'll put us further behind on our project. That's correct. Okay. And this bid is going to be extended as it sits right now. Uh, there's been some changes to the specifications. <laughs> Uh, so it will be extended, uh, I think, through January the 20th, I believe, will be the close date now. So it may give an opportunity for other bidders to take a look or take a closer look at it as well. And this will just this will just open us up to allow SCS field services to also bid on it, which doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, if we have multiple bidders, we won't necessarily take SCS. We might take, you know, company A or company B. You will have to take the lowest responsible yeah. bidder, uh, whether that's SCS or whether it's XYZ Corporation. Yeah. There is no further discussion. If the clerk would call the roll, please. Yes. 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 All right. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda, which is uh, exclusively for approval of minutes from July the 12th, 2022. Uh, looking for a motion and a second. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. All right. Motion by Mr. Farnham, second by the vice mayor. Just to clarify, would this be something the new guys would abstain from voting for these minutes? Uh, that would be. Yes, I, I advise them to abstain. Since okay. They... Yep. Yeah. All right. So uh, we got our motion from Mr. Farnham, second by the vice mayor. Uh, please call the roll. Yes. Holmes. Abstain. Hey. Yes. Father. Abstain. Yes. If there is no further business to come before the council, we stand adjourned. <laughs>